Welcome back to episode 95, folks, from the Panoramic Outdoors podcast here. Thanks for tuning in this week. Uh, I got myself on today, and I'm looking at my computer screen at uh, my brother Tristan here, tuning in from Lockport. Unfortunately, Sheldon is still uh, fixing a power line from the uh, devastating forest fires that we had this summer, so um, he's unable to join us on this one, but... uh, I'm sure he'll be tuning in. So, uh, hey, Shelly. Tristan, you know what week it is this week? It's a week in August. I think it's Burger Week, isn't it? Oh, Burger Week's coming up, yeah. So, I got this, like, foolproof plan to win Burger Week for anybody who's listening. You don't have any uh, You don't have any customers. I'm pretty sure you need to own a business. I, I know, just... I know. I'm. What I'm doing right now is, is handing out some free advice. And uh, the free advice is if you want to win Burger Week, get yourself a pit barrel because I did uh, I did four pounds of hamburgers on the pit barrel the other day and that gave me about, man, what did that give me? Give me a lot of freaking hamburgers. I'll tell you that. Just, I was just able to fit it on the pit barrel original, all four pounds of hamburgers. And uh, I know you've had burgers off there before and dare I say quite possibly the best hamburger you will ever have coming off that unit yeah i don't know if we got any restaurant owners queuing into the old panoramic here but uh i'm i'm a little surprised that we don't see uh more charcoal burgers on the old uh the old menu there i think i think they'd be a big hit in restaurants because that's not something you come across very often right that's right and uh yeah the flavor on those babies are second to none so if you're interested in stepping up uh, your flavor game on the barbecue, the outdoor grilling, go find yourself a pit barrel. Uh, head over to pitbarrelcookers.com. And if you're in Canada, they have a map of anywhere you can buy them across Canada, all the local retailers. And in the States, free shipping from the website. So super simple. Head over to the website, pick your cooker, pick your accessories, and uh, get grilling, folks. I... Uh... I've been eyeballing the the bigger cooker there that they got, so might have to pull the trigger sooner or later here. You know what? It's it's so silly because uh, they're so affordable too compared to like a uh, pellet grill, right? And they're super totally. simple to su- super simple to use. But uh, man, imagine how much food you could cook on that that PBX. Woo! Yeah, more coal and less bowl. That's for sure, right? Yeah, for sure. Well, I feel like it's a significant week for some other reasons too are you with me on this one i think so i think i think there's a lot of manitobans and if you're outside of manitoba your your game areas or your game seasons probably work pretty similar to ours i imagine and if you're in manitoba it means that it is opening week for a lot of hunting um my instagram feed has been filled with giddy men and women who are just itching to hit the outdoors and to do so legally so um i th- i think it's just it's a favorite time of year i don't know how else to describe it I, i'm definitely getting some uh some butterfly feelies uh in the in the tummy just uh thinking about it talking about it you know it's been a long wait for uh for the start of the season here and i still have some preseason stuff to get done i have a blind to put up which we've been not so much procrastinating but just life's been getting in the way a little bit so um you know that's got to get done we got to get some cameras up we haven't got any cameras up but the the good thing about like the area that we hunt is that i know you know the travel corridors are pretty much the same and uh i'm gonna get a couple days in hopefully here and do a couple evening scouts with the boys and see if we can you know just uh figure out what kind of what kind of deer numbers we're talking about on the fields and stuff like that it's all ag land, so put ourselves in a good position, and uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully we get lucky. I uh, I shot the dad bow there for the first time. I know uh, we got some new arrows from Heights there, and I thought I'd give them a whirl. I'm not sure Jason was too impressed with the old uh, send it and see what happens mentality, but I'll <laughs> give the stingray, the PSC stingray. I will give it this: it is consistent because that bow hit bang on first shot out of the out of the case there nice nice i hope you've flung a few more than just the uh the dual fletch arrow out of that sucker 
Oh yeah. Yeah. We got some practice reps in now. The, the muscles memory is starting to come back a little. The, uh, the one issue being it's been, it's been raining more than we've got more rain this like past two weeks in Manitoba here than we did all summer. So like, I don't know what's going on, but it's, uh, I haven't been shooting in the rain. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. Do you ever do any like, uh, like exercises that while you're shooting kind of thing? Like, for example, like when I shoot, um, if maybe I don't have an hour slot to, to shoot and kind of really wear myself out, I'll, I'll shoot a few arrows and then the next round of arrows, I will draw and hold every arrow kind of until I can't hold anymore and I'll release. And then the next ones, I'll just do a, a regular round kind of thing. Just, uh, I don't know. I think it just helps to build up my back muscles, build up some stabilizers and, and work on that, uh, that draw holding. Do you, ever, do you ever do anything like that? Well, when I was going to the gym, I, I would do a lot of back kind of work and whether that was banding or uh kind of like the 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 push pull regime there but uh that has not been happening so much so the exercises has been a big no this year it's uh mm-hmm. it's going to come down to a little bit of uh let's just hope that the muscle memory is there and uh the accuracy is there um but to be fair the past couple of seasons i haven't really gotten myself an opportunity where i needed to draw the bow back so <laughs> <laughs> let's That's... let's just be honest about that so that's uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah, we'll see what happens. We got to change that this year for sure. Yeah. If you guys are uh, interested in, in picking up some new gear, head down to our Heights Archery. They'll hook you up. They got what you need for archery equipment and firearm equipment or just general hunting stuff. They got loaded up with uh, elk calls, deer calls, scents, camo, targets, arrows, broadheads, ammunition, guns, pretty much anything you need. Heights Outdoors. Check them out. I can't believe how much gear they got. I, I, they might, they must be bursting at the seams there or something. I don't know. Maybe he's got like one of those magical bags in the back there that you just pull out more stuff from. But like, yeah, that's, uh, it's awesome to see how much stuff they got. I was kind of almost thinking about, about the uh, the scene from Bruce Almighty where he opens that filing cabinet and it just like never ends. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was thinking more of a Harry Potter thing, but uh so you got two fan bases here. You don't. You guys can DM us. I'm not. I'm not too deep into the Harry Potter thing, but I've seen them all multiple times. So let us know if you're more of a, a Bruce Almighty or a, a Harry Potter. What side of the fence are you on here? On the magical, never-ending hunting equipment bag slash filing cabinet. <laughs> oh, that's good. Um, another kind of exciting thing that's been happening is. Uh, our buddy Brian there has been doing some scouting. Mm. Shout out to, uh, to Brian. And uh, he, he's run into some of his own issues. I was chatting with him a little bit today. and oh, uh, yeah. But as I said I in the th- other podcast before, he's sending me more waypoints and stuff. And we're sharing routes and, and, and drawings of like areas that, you know, I think he should be checking out kind of yeah. thing on iHunter. If you guys aren't familiar with that. So, um <laughs> And no offense, like Brian is not a tech savvy guy. No offense, Brian. I love you, man. CEO of the Panoramic Fan Club, just to be clear. Um, so get in touch with him if you need a membership to the Panoramic Fan Club. But you're right, Brian's sending me waypoints and all kinds of things through the iHunter app. So like, I think it, a, it speaks to the usability, the functionality, but also like just the fact that it's a relevant scouting tool too. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Definitely. Uh, it, it's interesting too, because like... Um, before I added him onto iHunter, um, we were kind of having a conversation through text and, and, uh, I remember him telling me about this water hole or this water like feature on the land that was, um, on the property. And those are always something I want to check out when it comes to either deer hunting or elk hunting or whatever. And, uh, he said, he's like, oh, it's kind of open going up to this, this big water hole. I was kind of, you know, a very undescriptive description of the kind of land around. And I just thought to myself, you know, this is, this is so silly. Why don't I just hop on iHunter and you can show me what exactly where, where you are, what you're talking about. And, uh, you get such a better lay of the land as soon as you open that up and have a look at the satellite imagery on there. So. Yeah, it's amazing how much scouting you can actually accomplish on your phone 
now because of that. And I can tell that it's getting closer to hunting season because that my usage, I can look, I can check my u- app usage on the phone. And my uh, iHunter app is way up, uh, which is a good thing though. I still got to cache some, uh, some maps and get them all settled into my phone there for offline usage. But I'll tell you one thing about that water hole chase because I've had boots on the ground there. I think that thing's going to be dry. Well, it might be holding water now that we got all that rain, but earlier in the month, it would have been dry. Mm-hmm. But what I was able to do was, was uh, between, between the combination of the Crown Map or Crown Lands public lands subscription there and some of the landowner stuff, I found a water hole on Crown Land less than a mile away from him. Oh, beauty. And that one looks big and it looks deep. So like, I think, you know, it was, I, I've never seen that water hole. So I, I'd go check it out. But like, I mean, within 30 seconds, I was able to find like an alternative hunting spot that, you know, I have to kind of go take a look at. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So I think the efficiency gains, like all this on my phone are just incredible to, to be using this app. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, if, if you want to check them out there, if you want to get that public land subscription that I was just talking about that helped me find that water hole, Use our promo code Panoramic30. That's going to give you 30% off that subscription. And, uh, you know, say hi to Mark while, while you're there for us because uh, we just had him on the podcast. Mark's a great guy. He's out on the East Coast now. And uh, hopefully he's going to have a good season coming up too. Yeah. Make sure you head to web.ihunter.com. Uh, I think that's what it is. I got to double check. <laughs> but uh, that that's where you can use that promo code and uh, get you 30% off of that um, public land owner subscription or public land subscription. Wow. Um, the, all this rain again, you know, it's been raining nonstop. We're supposed to get like a mill today and it's, I'm pretty sure we got about at least an inch right now in the, in the rain gauge, but. And I say this every time, if I, if I performed as poorly as I do as uh weather persons did, like there's no way that, uh, that I'd be keeping my job. Yeah. It's pretty wild. But the the one good thing about the what we have in our arsenal for the rainy season is this wool love stuff, man. And I'm not kidding you. I'm I'm bragging this stuff up hard because like you know when you get wet in like a cotton shirt and you're just oh man, now I'm going to be like chilly. I'm going to have the shivers for like the next at least half hour to an hour till I dry off right? Especially right now, it's cool out and yeah, they got to go to somewhere warm to dry out or you just got to wait it out and be super uncomfortable. Well, I've been in the rain with the wool love and I've been sweating in the wool love all last year, you know, hunting season, trekking around and it's unbelievable how your comfort levels change from like the cotton gear to the uh, merino wool, wool love gear. Um, You get that like initial, initial cool down from the from the contact with the with the water from the rain or whatever it is but you're instantly back to a comfortable temperature after like seconds after that which is amazing and it'll keep you out there in the field longer it'll keep you comfortable longer allow you to hunt longer or do whatever you're doing longer so if you if you guys are interested in uh getting some wool love and you want some free money to put towards that wool love Slide into our DMs. Tell us that you want some free money from Wool Loves. From Wool Love, I can't talk today, and uh, we'll shoot your, uh, we'll shoot you back, and we'll get you uh, um, some free money from them to put towards your next order. And I, I, I cringe now when I see cotton hunting clothing because I mean, to be honest, we used to hunt a lot in cotton. Um, that's kind of what was available to us when we were coming up, learning the ropes, stuff like that. Even the synthetics, you know, yeah. they're great yeah. when they're dry. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? Unless you got the, like, top-line Gore-Tex stuff, you, you might be running into some problems even, right? So mm-hmm. um, you, you got to love wool for that reason. And I, I, I know, Chase, when you were guiding, you would run wool all, all the time. Um, but, yeah, the, the only time I want to be in a wet cotton anything is when it's 30 above out and even then i'd rather be in the air conditioning than in a wet cotton shirt or something like that right Mm -hmm. so yeah if if you're not running wool or something like maybe 
check it out. I would say it's 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 not uh, this Merino stuff's not the itchy stuff that uh, you would have thought about uh, when your grandparents knitted you a wool sweater for your for Christmas, right? So uh, we're big fans of wool love. Make sure you check them out. We think they they got a great product uh, to serve not just the hunting but the hiking, any kind of community, right? That you're you're going to be outside and encountering the elements. Yeah. Okay. I got to ask you a question. I can hear Willie. Yeah. or some That's definitely rodent <laughs> chewing on something in the background there what's uh housing is looking for, shaping up this fall for for him what are you thinking what's well, your predictions he's uh he's definitely bird crazy i'll say that much um and he i'm pretty sure he he caught and killed a hun at your old place sir yeah he definitely came back with a with a hot hun we'll say yeah so uh, I think he's got a, a nose for him. Lately, we've been squirrel hunting, so I'm, I'm a little worried that he thinks squirrels are the primary game target at the moment and not, <laughs> not chickens. That's all right. I got a good squirrel hunting spot we got to hit up this winter. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's game for it. Let me tell you, he watches the trees now. I'm like, oh, boy, what did I do? I need you using your nose, not looking up at the goddamn trees here. Anyways, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm super excited to get him out. I gotta get. I gotta fire some uh, something bigger than a twenty-two around him, though. So that's something I might actually do this weekend: is uh, take him out, start introducing him to gunfire. I, from all the reading and consulting I've been doing, this is not something you just want to do uh, either while you're hunting or just in a half half-ass way. You want to do it intentionally here. You want to have a plan, and you want to know when you need to pull the plug if the dog's gonna scare. Because there's nothing worse than a a uh, gun shy dog that you spent all this time training right so gun shy gun dog heck yeah. yeah that that sounds like a good beer name maybe a <laughs> maybe a song name someone someone get in touch with dell here that sounds like a non-alcoholic beer name yeah gun shy <laughs> gun dog yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah oh man maybe eh? hey but you need that too right some people drink uh non-alcoholic drinks so yeah uh, yeah totally. not wrapping them but um, so super excited about episode 95 here. We got Rich and Sandy Mellon from Trapping Inc. coming on here. And if you guys aren't familiar with them, they are um, probably the most popular outdoor uh, television show on in Canada here. And, um, you know, it's all trapping. We talk about getting their trap line, establishing it, and everything they do out there, and safety, and, and all kinds of stuff. So, um an amazing conversation, an amazing couple people to to hang with for a little bit there. And uh, yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, one of the things that uh, I enjoyed most is they just have like some of the biggest personalities I've ever been around. They are just uh, incredibly like warm and uh, fun people. Right. So like, I think no matter who they're talking to, the, it's the room is just going to be filled with energy and excitement. Right. Oh yeah, big energy, big energy, big charisma, and uh, I don't know. I had a blast having a conversation with them. So we hope you enjoy it. It's coming right at you. All right, and we're joined tonight on the Panoramic Outdoors podcast by a couple trappers hailing out of uh, Northern Alberta, I believe, uh, Rich and Sandy Mellon. Did I get that correct? You yes, met? you did. Whereabouts are you guys uh, tuning in from from Alberta right now? Uh, we're about 5K outside of uh, the city of Grand Prairie. 5K? Uh, 50K. <laughs> you're, you're here to make Seems sure like I get Seems like a longer right. drive to me. <laughs> <laughs> you always keep me on the street now. <laughs> Amazing. Well, welcome to the podcast, you guys. Thank you for joining us. And uh, I know we've been uh, chatting back and forth a little bit, and it's it's uh, nice to finally be able to connect with you guys and, and, and get you on. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and thanks for working around our schedule, which yeah, got a little crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. yeah, our life falls apart regularly, but... No worries. Anyway, it's, it's good to be busy, right? Yeah, we're no stranger to that, and it seems like... Uh, I hate to just talk about COVID more, but it seems like as much as people are staying home as COVID, it seems like everyone's also busier as well somehow. So at least that's how it feels on my end. So, but that could Not be here the... in Alberta. No, we're, we're free white and 21 here. <laughs> we have, we have been for months. 
Nice. We have no, we have, we have no, uh, no masks or, or uh, closures or anything. Yeah. 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 Everything's opening back up right on. Yeah. Yep. Um, how's, uh, besides that though, we were talking a little bit just before we got recording there. How's, how's the, the general, um, feeling of, of the summer going there for you guys, you know, over in Manitoba here, very dry drought now getting some rain, but, uh, bad fire year for Manitoba. How, how has th- things been your way? Well, we, uh, it is very dry here. We just had about an inch of rain probably, yeah. um, over the last couple of days, heavy rainfall warnings and so on. But the, the farmers are in a sorry state here. Feed is at a premium and, um, Saskatchewan uh, just did some revisions, I guess, to their crop uh, insurance program and Alberta followed suit. So hopefully some of those farmers with cattle and other animals to feed can benefit from a little of that. But yeah, we're we as dry as it's been, though, um, we haven't had the forest fires like BC has had. So yeah. BC has been much worse, much yeah. worse than we have. Yeah. Um, I, it, the only thing that's happened here is uh, the horse with no, no name died on the desert in the front yard. <laughs> <laughs> but we've, we've uh, uh, got problems with uh, with elk and uh, moose and deer on our on the, on the home quarter here, and I had to send the, the loyal dogs after a, a couple of cow out there eating your lettuce today. <laughs> <laughs> no Best way. garden we've grown in years, and the elk have decided that they were going to claim it. So. Yeah, I've actually had had to build uh, metal uh, uh, wire cages over top of the rows of lettuce because they they'll eat, you should see the beets they have eaten the beets right down to there's there's just red bumps in the ground that, that's it you know <laughs> oh i bet you they're probably in their glory there they just found the the nice little hmm. uh little oasis for them to come have a snack oh yeah yeah they'll be in their <laughs> glory until uh wednesday <laughs> open, se- season. open season <laughs> <laughs> We don't shoot bow, but we might learn. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, might have to. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be learning real quick if there was a bunch of elk mowing down on my garden. That's for sure. <laughs> that's Amazing. Funny. Well, before we get to, too deep into the the meat and potatoes of things, let's uh, do our five burning questions here for you, for you guys. And uh, like I said earlier, just answer these how you will. And um, yeah, so um, should I be afraid? <laughs> I think you guys are good. I'm I'm looking forward to hearing the answers here. We got a few good ones for you. Okay. Um, first question is, what is the best trap line meal? Oh. Ooh, kind of hard to beat spam on a stick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought but, he was going to no, say my listen. casserole that I put in the oven and lovingly made for him, and he says spam on a stick. Hey, listen. Because by the awesome. by the time you're down to spam on a stick sounding good, that's a great meal. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's like come on. Dehydrated anything on the mountain, right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You got a sheep on your back, and, and you got a dehydrated bag of, of powder, and and it's the best thing you ever eat in your yep. in your life. Been there, done that. <laughs> what would you vote for for the best meal? Well, I wasn't gonna say spam. I remember cold but... pizza one day, and it was oh, twenty six yeah. below. Cold pizza. There yeah. you go. <laughs> Yeah. Saves you from starving to death. Yeah. Yeah. Anything's good when you're hungry, right? When you're starving. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, the second thing I want to ask you too is what's your uh, favorite hot drink on the trap line? Do you, you, you guys bring a thermos of anything or are you just. Our old smokes coffee, actually. <laughs> yeah. That's what we drink. <laughs> That's awesome. We, we, we actually have our own brand. Our, they, yeah. They're actually uh, doing a, a blend for us. Uh, yeah. they're, they're smoking it with maple and. It's a little a little darker than, than his darkest and no way yeah, trapping in coffee yeah i'm into that so you guys are into the dark roast like the oh, the, yeah. the dirt yeah. take Flavor, taste man. and dark roast kind of thing which like the the really like i guess like i always like the dark roast that tastes like really earthy we'll say well this stuff is smoked oh. so there's a it's quite a subtle difference but yeah. um it it's just a great cup of coffee you want me so. to take this away Okay. <laughs> in the right old in. days, when we roasted coffee, we roasted it over top of a fire, and of course, it ended up getting smoked. And then we then we went to uh, natural gas or, or hot air, and so then there was no flavor added. You could control your roasting pretty precisely. Mm-hmm. And have, have you guys ever roasted coffee beans? Never have. Really Can't cool. It's it's like popping popcorn, but you do it twice. 
So you guys, gonna... you guys were literally roasting your own coffee over fire. Wait, no, what? we don't. We... But old oh, back in the old day, smoke says it for us. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, but I've been there and and uh, <clears throat> I have witnessed it. How's that? Oh, there you go. But when when you when you um, roast coffee beans, uh, they crack twice. They make a sound just like popping popcorn once, and then uh, after that happens, uh, you wait till the second one happens, and however long you are after that second crack is whether you've got a, a light roast, a medium roast, a dark roast. So lot, one, of, one of the things that a lot of people don't understand is that the darker the roast, the less ca- caffeine it has. And that's because caffeine's a volatile oil and it's it's getting uh, cooked out, basically. Mm-hmm. But you get a lot more flavor. So did you guys think you were going to learn about coffee tonight? <laughs> <'Cause> I'm pretty <laughs> sure you didn't. <laughs> so anyway, our, our particular brand is is uh, smoked using maple maple wood. Okay, that's what it, what it's roasted with, and, nice. and uh, you know it's kind of like having your bacon right there in a the cup. You know what I mean? <laughs> I like that. I'm gonna have to order me some of that. But uh, yeah. speaking about coffee, so... oh, there you go. Yeah. Tried and true Canadian, right there. Yeah, yeah. No kidding. That's so, our third question I'm gonna run to actually, and it might uh, overlap this one a little bit. What What's your favorite wood to burn? Oh, well, it. Um... At home, it's the birch because we we can get it delivered here. But when we're out on the trap line, um, it is beetle killed pine is mm. what goes in the stove mostly. Yeah, because that's what we have. Yeah, uh, we we're pretty limited on our uh, um, like birch is the hardest hardwood you you find in Alberta outside of tamarack, and it's not really a hardwood. It's a well, like, yeah, it's one of those weird ones. It's kind yeah. of confused like a hyena, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she says you know uh we like birch because we can get it delivered she doesn't mention that it comes in seventy thousand pound load at a time you know we get a, a logging truck load worth and, and then I, I run it through the processor and all that and we have you know 20 some uh cords out, uh, stacked out in the in the yard here but Ooh. yeah birch is what we we burn it's it's the most efficient like got the most heat in it because mm-hmm. it's a hardwood um it has uh doesn't have any problems with uh with with sparks or or that that kind of stuff um you know we don't have that out of the cabin our cabin is uh about what three hours from door to door yeah yeah so up on our trap line is three hours away so we we use what's there and we've already done our wood for the year we got it done really early this year which was good because we've had a a kind of interesting and different summer so it gave us lots of time to do different things yeah, we we literally like came back from BC. We were over our taxidermists in West Kelowna, and we were over picking up our uh, um, our last safari from Africa. And we literally slammed the door in BC, and then it caught on fire. <laughs> it was like it wasn't our fault. Was, yeah, yeah, end, yeah, I was gonna ask. <laughs> were you roasting coffee out in BC? And no, we were. <laughs> One might think that. Yeah. That's funny. So when you guys, when you say too, just so uh, maybe some some people that don't know firewood very well, when you when you're talking about burning birch and you don't get the sparks out of it, and generally you're talking about like uh, when you burn pine or or one of those deciduous trees, you get the really sap in there that sparks and cracks and explodes, right? And that's what what gives yeah, you that exactly. those big sparks, right? Yeah, we sell a lot of our birch to campers and cabin owners in the area because they or backyard fire pits because mm-hmm. they don't want their neighbor's house to catch on fire well yeah. and it's a, it's it's kind of a a guy thing too like i mean they're not po folks they're not they're not, they're not burning pine or, or poplar they yeah. it's alberta they're oil patch guys they can they can afford to buy birch yeah <laughs> I think like that. the firewood flex man <laughs> exactly. There you go. <laughs> I'm gonna copyright that tomorrow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so how much how much do you guys usually burn in the winter though? I'm curious about that. At the cabin? Um, throughout the winter. Yeah, probably six cord of wood at the cabin, but that's our only source of heat. So yeah. um and and I like fire. Oh yeah. The oh, I'm yeah. the queen of fire. <laughs> <laughs> and we uh in our fireplace here, uh, in our house, our house is very efficient. It's ICF to the attic and all that good stuff. And it's actually got geothermal in it. We heat with geothermal, oh, yeah. but don't ever do geothermal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I built I built it in 2007. Uh, another part of my life, I'm a builder. And 
I, I built it in 2007. It's one thing to build a nice house. It's another thing to afford to live in it. And at the time, 2007, uh, natural gas was very high and electricity was cheap. And geothermal runs on electricity. So yeah, I've, yeah. I've, I've been able to uh, regret at my leisure on, on that one, that choice. But <laughs> you can't turn back the clock, though. So instead, yeah. we just burn a lot of birch woods. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> probably, probably about three cords in, in the house. Yeah. 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 Nice. So our fourth question for you, if you could visit one spot besides the trap line, where would you be going? Say for a Africa. holiday or something. Yeah. <laughs> you want to go back to Africa again? Yeah. Africa or Costa Rica? It's kind of a yeah. We know beautiful people in Africa now, though, and we don't know very many people in Costa Rica. So I'd probably have to say Africa. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but I mean, there's a reason they call it big game fishing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I love I love walleye life. fishing, and you guys live in the middle of it. Yeah, you guys live in the in the epicenter of the world of walleye fishing. Uh, we don't have that so much here in Alberta by any means, but. There is no such thing as fishing as big game fishing, and uh, we've I don't know, we've done Costa Rica three times. We've done Guatemala and Ecuador, Ecuador and all that kind of stuff. And um, Africa is a hoot uh, just because forty one uh, species of of indigenous big game just in South Africa, like forty one different huntable species. That's just it's crazy. We have fourteen in Alberta, and and, and we're like top of the heap in 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 North America. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we'd have 15 if we could still hunt grizzly bear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, Africa is, is one of those things, but we're going to do Africa. We're going to do Spain. She got okay. a real kick. We, we went and did Spain one time. We went hunting and we did Ibex over there. And um, we did uh, Bassetti, mm -hmm. the Bassetti Ibex. They have, they have four there, the um, Rondo, Southeastern, and the Gritos and the Bassetti. Anyway, she got a kick out of it. We stayed in a in a monastery that was built in 1124 or something like that. But we were in we were in the new wing. It was built in the 1600s. So we had toilets. <laughs> <laughs> it was the coolest place. Oh. The alabaster windows. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was really cool. But the builder in him got the better of the of the tour guide, and he kept looking around. And she asked him what he was looking at for, or was he did he drop something or whatever and he said no i'm just trying to figure out where the quarry is that you got all the stone from to build the monastery and they went oh well we just tore down a, a um an old moorish, an old moorish, moorish castle, castle yeah. and built it out of that stone so so how many years ago before the you know, 1100 in, yeah, something in, i don't know in 1100s there was just an old fixer upper that was ready to be torn down and be reused you know what Jeez. i mean <laughs> Tell, cool. tell about La Cassiote. Oh, so we <laughs> came, in, we came, came into the little town that we were staying in. It's so interesting because you get out of the metropolis area um, and everything is sort of goat tracks almost, you know, like out in the countryside. So we came into this little place called Castellote. And um, as we drove into town, it was getting dark so it, it it was past sunset but it wasn't dark dark yet and the facade of this castle was lit up up on a ridge up, up on a up, ridge and, the and we said wow that's really something and they said oh yes we uh it's only lit up though when special people come to town and we went whoa who's here <laughs> you guys <laughs> 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 so anyone knew that was good but there was a bullfighting arena across from the little bed and breakfast type place that we were staying in it was yeah. so cool yeah, yeah. We, and we went we went and, no that was ecuador where we yeah. went and seen the guy who who yeah. trained bulls and and the horses, horses. for for bullfighting and the horses they were the pasifinos yeah i don't remember. they were pasifinos anyway they're very a very proud horse and 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 he they, they were trotting around a circle and, and three quarters of the circle was was sand and then there was um cobblestone. cobblestone and so as they go around it hits this cobblestone and you can see the horse its neck arch its tail picks up and it just starts snapping those feet up and down and and the guy turns to me and says he says this year he says we are teaching them arrogance <laughs> 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 hey, she should get my setter in there he needs a little lesson in arrogance i think <laughs> yeah. we got way off the beaten path here Man, oh, that's fine yeah. you, you guys sound yeah. like yeah 
You guys sound like you get on some awesome adventures. That sounds like a good time. Yeah. Um, my last question for our five questions here to get to know you. What is uh, something that's overrated in the trapping industry? Oh, overrated. Uh, okay, this is kind of kind of not the way you're gonna the direction you're gonna expect. <laughs> um, ranch fur. Ranch fur. Ranch fur. Ranched fur. Ranched yeah. fur. And the reason so I fur say farm. that mm -hmm. fur farms is they uh, have been using actual trappers uh, and wild fur as uh, justification for their trade for years. That because they build a, a, a fur garment, you know, like a mink garment, then they put trim on it, which might be lynx or it might be marten or whatever. But that trim is is the only wild fur they're using. But there's, you know, they say they're employing all these trappers and and especially the the indigenous side, they like to drag that out when it's when it's helpful. And, and uh, it's, to me, it's uh, uh, something that's going to need to be accounted for. And right now we're kind of in a neat situation where most of the world doesn't have mink anymore. Hmm. Uh, you know, they, who knew that they could get COVID, but they got COVID and they've been killed off. Like I think, well, what was Scandinavian countries? It was like 150 million mink were killed and, and they just into, into the dump and dozed them over and that kind of right. thing. Right. So, so in the fur so, farms, they got, they got COVID and died. Yeah. Yes. No way. Yeah. 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 I, not in the wild population. No, no, our populations yeah. wouldn't be have, wouldn't be thick enough for it to ever happen. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's why we don't have problem with with COVID in Alberta because we don't ever bump into one another. You know, <laughs> <laughs> There's a little space between. Yeah. Us. <laughs> it's, it, it's interesting how some of that wild farming plays out because I know there there's issues with some of the fish farms that have been occurring on the west coast and um, also even with some of the, the like the large game farming we know that uh like even cwd kind of emerged um out of that vein so yeah I, I guess when you start getting wild animals congregated in small spaces sometimes the risk of uh transmission and bad things just seems to increase for whatever reason one that we thought would be really interesting to see though is is ranch skunk <laughs> <laughs> like, like a that's a not a joke, actually. A <laughs> friend of ours. Well, Rich is laughing pretty hard, so uh, uh, yeah, you, yeah, have you, met, you haven't met him before. This is his okay. whole thing. He just laughs all the time. Rich, <laughs> Rich are, are you on the dark roast or the blonde roast over there, pal? <laughs> dark, dark, dark. Right, I definitely got to get me some of that. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, there's uh, actually skunk essence has some really unique qualities. And one of it is the ability to remove things like heavy metals from the blood. Oh, really? They're doing a bunch of studies on it. But their biggest problem is to try and get enough, how to get it. So this one guy who's doing all the studies, uh, I don't know if, if you ever watched uh, our, our show uh, once a year or whatever, we usually have Ryan Demchinsky from Saskatchewan, and he's on the show. And, and uh, one of the shows we did it with him was on skunks. And so he got talking about how this, this guy had reached out to him and, and uh, wanted him to, uh, you know, look at commercially raising skunks because they want want uh, the uh, uh the, <laughs> the essence. essence so we sat they there don't, and, they don't want to kill them all if you just want to take the essence yeah but if you've ever been uh you know seen what a mink farm or whatever looks like you've got a basically you know like a a, a archery building and it's got you know two thousand animals in it right mm -hmm. well ryan and i were spitballing the one night and started laughing and he says can you imagine he says, being in the middle of the, those 2,000 skunks, he said, when a lightning strike happened, I said, you better shoot yourself now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just have one bolt in the gun. That's all you need. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Just like a, it would be. <laughs> yeah. Just like a fighter pilot. Keep one in the one in the chamber in case you're going down. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting, though, because a lot of the indigenous populations still, they, they do use it uh, medicinally. Yeah. Really? So, yeah. yeah. Trapper Gorge is across the river from us here, uh, across the Smoky River, and uh, he'll buy all the skunk that I can get my hands on, and and uh, uh, mostly he, he he gives it to the doesn't even sell it, he just gives it to to the indigenous like Treaty Eight, and that, that, that they all they believe it has really uh, great qualities for for curing special colds well, and that kind health, of stuff, and, overall uh, health, yeah, and wellness, and, and health, yeah. and they just drink it. They drink it. Yes. They drink it. Incredible! Yeah. Wow. I think I know what it would taste like. I haven't tasted it, but yeah, because when you're there at mm. when you're extracting in that, you know, I mean, as careful as you are, still, I mean, it's just overpowering. But you taste garlic. Mm -hmm. That's what you taste. 
Hmm. You know, yeah, I mean, right in the very back of your throat, you taste garlic. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's yeah. Wild. Every time I, I get on social media and say I'm feeling down or whatever, one of my buddies from Treaty Eight. Well, yeah, Treaty Eight <laughs> or whatever will be, oh, I got I got some skunk here for you. You should take you should use some skunk. I say, I ain't that far. <laughs> <laughs> my wife won't let me back in the house. I cannot imagine. No. <laughs> well, it's uh, it, it's been a few years since I've I've uh, run some traps on my own, but I know um, setting out a little Martin magic, and I think that's skunk lure on there. Yep. And yeah. by the end of the day, setting up first round of traps or checking traps, man, I got a splitting headache at the end of the day because uh, just the the smell of that stuff is well, it, if, if, it has to ride outside of the argo yeah well I'm i there. was i was doing most of my stuff by road access so if it yeah. uh, if it got on my my mitt or a little bit on my <laughs> sleeve or something you know obviously i wasn't careful enough with uh with the application of it <laughs> and uh it, it, yeah. it made that spam sandwich taste a little special <laughs> yeah <laughs> i think we just developed a new grand prairie shot here a little martin magic in the uh <laughs> yeah well rich makes his own um brand martin. Of, of martin yeah. um uh, we're not going to call it magic i'm no. not sure what we'll call it something different it's got it's got quite a combo of stuff in it but i gotta come up with a cool name for it though yeah. like i mean guys in the states like i mean hellfire you know oh. long range death you know that's a, that's a different brands of lures right it's like, <laughs> Not that They're creative. very confident. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So I'm, I'm kind of interested here. Um, you guys have been uh, doing the trapping thing for quite some time, but uh, how did you guys kind of find your way into the outdoor scene? Like, did you grow up in it? Um, I, I've got well, a little. I did. I've got a little background. I did a little background work, but let's 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 say our listeners don't have a clue <laughs> about you let's too. Let's see if they can catch us with something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I I grew up in the life. I was here in the north, and uh, my home my hometown is Grand Prairie, and uh, I I believe we say it in the opening to our hunting show that I was 18 before I ever ate beef, and it's the truth. And uh, it was uh, it was with with my lovely lady here who. Uh, who uh, comes from Vermilion, which is just outside of uh, Edmonton. Well, two hours. hours. In Alberta, that's just outside. Yeah. Two hours. <laughs> anyway, uh, and, and I was taking her out for trying to impress the lady and everything. Uh, I had beef for the first time. I was like, ooh, well, it's kind of like tasteless moose. But <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I, bore, I was born into the life. I've, uh, I lived it here. Um, Him and his brother um, <laughs> were just two peds that- Two peas in a pod, and their their parents would drop them off in January on a Friday night somewhere out in the bush, and they'd arrange a rendezvous point on Sunday sometime, and they would and they they go out with maybe a twenty two and they're older, a larger gun maybe, but um, a sleeping bag and a sleep, oh yeah, well a sleeping bag. Yeah, 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 to, yeah to build and a, a couple lean-to. tins. I think that's where his affection for spam has come from, really. <laughs> um it's just the good old days right well, well still i mean to this day my only ability when it comes to cooking something dies and i introduce it to fire that's it you know sorry <laughs> <laughs> all this time yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah but i was not raised um in the outdoors uh really at all i mean camping uh was as as far into the outdoors as we ever got my dad was not a hunter or a fisherman or a trapper um and neither was any any of his family. His father had immigrated from Scotland, and they were they were more on the um, financial side of things, I guess. Like my granddad was uh, was town secretary for a few different places around the Vermilion area, and my dad was a, an electrician. My mom was a nurse, and we were just we were just raised in town. Mm-hmm. Um, loved the farm like lots of friends with farms and loved all of that but didn't get introduced to the hunting fishing trapping community until i ran into this guy so yeah. <laughs> we got married in a fever <laughs> <laughs> okay johnny cash it's all good don't break into song <laughs> hey we're not we're not canoeing in for my oh, yeah. i ain't gonna say that's true <laughs> anniversary <laughs> no uh, we got married in october um uh, 5th of October, 5th or 6th, 
Good guess. Yeah. Yeah. Don't yeah. get that one wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Which one of the kids is born on the six? <laughs> uh, Melissa. Okay. See, I knew. <laughs> I always get the two confused. Mm. Anyway, um, I managed to, and and our our whole honeymoon was we we drove in a loop down to White Court over to to Hinton and back to Grand Prairie. But on the on the uh, last leg of of the loop, uh, it was moose season, and I had a tag and. <laughs> <laughs> Happy honeymoon. She made it, <laughs> made it a memorable one. Memorable yeah, one. Well, yeah. yeah, pretty much every weekend's a, it, it's memorialized in some fashion or another. So I, at some point, um, very quickly, she realized that if she was really going to get to know me, you know, uh, I, I think it's a stubborn Scotsman in her. Is that, you know, she wasn't going to admit she made a mistake. So <laughs> she had to get to know me. And so she took up how to get fish again. For our first Christmas together, we got married in October. Our first Christmas together, I bought her this really sweet 270 Winchester that I'd always wanted. Damn, she shot it so damn good. I've never shot it. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? What's the definition of the best gift, guys? When she says, that's the last thing I thought I was getting. That's the best. That, total surprise, right? Nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah my partner shoots a 272 and i i wish i uh had more access to that firearm because it's a it's a sweet little unit it is yeah. that's, it still is, that's funny yeah many guns later um it's still a a, a, me- a very good memory it's a safe queen now yeah it yeah. is yeah. just like the barbie gun yeah <laughs> oh god yeah that's a whole other story <laughs> when um uh inline muzzle loader started to become a big deal uh she got one uh, you got to pick one uh, we, we yeah. were we were working with thompson center arms yeah. on uh, outdoor quest we we were partners in outdoor quest for 18 years 20 years no from 99 to to oh, 17 17 yeah, yeah. yeah. okay yeah 18 so years. like 18 years yeah anyway uh and so every year of course you have you you have to use their their uh weapons on on the show and I, so i i got the the one the uh, muzzle loader I'd wanted the year before. Well, she decided she wanted to get one, and then it, it became like accessorizing the the, <laughs> the rings. The stainless rings didn't match the the stainless on the gun, and didn't and the scope was right. So it was more like we were accessorizing this bloody gun so that it, everything matched, rather than the brands that were important, like the sponsors that were paying the bill. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so it became the Barbie gun. I even wrote an article about yeah. it. And yeah. Yeah. yeah, did, yeah. Did it did it shoot straight? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We uh had to, at at that time, of course, um pellets like Hodgson pellets and that were were a big thing. And um uh suppose. So mm-hmm. uh Hornady brought out their the uh the shockwave and yeah. you know the Sabo bullet, right? Well the first um we got two boxes. We got, you know. Once again, because they were a, a sponsor, we, we could get them quickly. And and uh, we got two boxes. That was it. And they're 20 in a box. And we shot the, f- the first 20, and she was having a great time, you know, making little holes at 100 yards. And we zeroed it, the, the gun at 200 yards, three and three quarters inch high at 100. And uh, it, it was all good until we come down to it. Now we, we just got a box of 20 left. And, and she wanted to shoot more. And I says, we can't get no more. And she says, get more i says listen i know that usually i can get more this time i can't <laughs> this is it <laughs> this is it and uh, so we took that box of 20 and then we we hunted that year with it we got 19 animals with the tw- with the box of 20 i had to uh i had to what did i have to take a second shot about i don't remember but you you wrote an article about yeah that. yeah it was pretty cool yeah. it was pretty cool yeah he's been writing for years but um the last several has been a trapping, a trapping column, but have, has recently retired from that obligation so that we can focus on a few different tweaks we want to make to the trapping show. And that takes always anything different that you do always takes some time to set it up. And, and there's lots of filming and lots yeah. of stuff like that. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, it's, it's funny. Um, did, did you want us just to wander off on our own here? <laughs> <laughs> no, just, pardon us, we'll just take over. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask about Outdoor Quest. Like you, you were with them for a number of years there. Like how yeah. was that? And then obviously you at some point decided 
that you had your own pursuits that you kind of wanted to go after? And well, that's was- where the, the whole thing, that's kind of how we got into TV anyway. Yeah. So TJ Schwanke um, and his wife at the time, Kim, had gone down to SHOT Show. At the time. <laughs> well, they're not together anymore. Mm. So um, they came back all excited because the four of us had been talking about putting together a TV show and that um, that Kim and I would feature in it. Back it up one more time. Um, he had done a TV, a yes. fishing show with, yeah. with Bob Kirkpatrick in Saskatchewan. Yes. Mm-hmm. And at the time I was, uh, I was fishing the PWT. I uh, was a professional fisherman on the PWT and uh, I had a lot of connections in the fishing world. So uh, we thought that if we did a, uh, a TV show that was half hunting, half fishing. Well, I had a bunch of connections that I that I could bring the the sponsors in because you know what, it's all about making it pay for itself. Everybody asks me, how'd you get into TV and all that? You become a salesman. That's how. And it's the toughest job. The the worst product you're ever going to sell yourself. <laughs> Hardest problem, yeah. not worst yeah. problem. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can sell anything a lot better than I than I would say. You know, I, I'm to, I'm cantankerous old white guy it's like trust me i'm gonna do the job okay you know <laughs> that somehow that doesn't sell a lot i don't know I, go figure <laughs> so anyway tj and i got together and uh, we started with the uh, with outdoor quest yeah so and uh then from there we were the first show that really featured women uh, as hunters and fishermen and um and then the trend kind of caught on and you can certainly still see it today and there's an awful lot of uh young women getting into it that are getting into hunting later in their lives too you know and really coming coming full circle on that so we did that for a number of years but then as so we started we filmed our first um first hunt in montana and we uh kim and i were hunting bison Uh, so it was it was a really cool cool hunt and from there it just kind of took off so they sort of did their their hunting on their you know on their turf or whatever and we did ours but then the these guys would get together and at the time we um we hired a, an editor and uh, a producer but when you hire people that don't know anything about the outdoors you yeah. you're mm-hmm. you're standing over their shoulder pretty much telling them which button to push which segment you want in or out or whatever Mm -hmm. so then they taught themselves how to edit and um well right then we were just going from analog to digital we got lucky in a way because the fellow that was working with us that we were that we had hired had all the analog stuff and to get into it at that time those big beta cameras were 70 grand for a used one oh yeah yeah for a used one and that didn't, that had nothing to do with an edit suite or, yeah, or yeah, anything yeah. like that. So we. Media 100. Yeah. It was a quarter of a mil for that suite. Yeah. Yeah. So wow. we, we dodged lots of, we, but without knowing, we just sort of guided ourselves along a, a different path. And then as digital started to become more mainstream, then, then things took a different turn, but mm-hmm. we worked really well together. We were partners, um, all four of us in that for a number of years until um well kim and tj then split up and then he he's uh, with vanessa and has been for a number of years now too but it got increasingly difficult to hunt in north america um particularly in alberta because the the number of tags that were issued became less and less um it just everything was difficult so then you know we, what what ended up happening though is it came down to business once again, and that's where um, your 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 own producer, your your own salesman, and everything else. When you and how you get on TV is you buy your way on. Okay, you pay for your time, and that is based on on uh, when your airings are going to be, and how many airings a week, and how many uh, minutes of commercial you buy. Okay. So that's all you've got to sell to your to your sponsors. And here in Canada, with the CRTC breathing down your neck, it's just garbage. But you've you when uh, you're doing a half hour show, there are there are twelve commercials in that half hour show. So it's really simple to figure out how much money's in it. If you could sell all twelve of them to uh, you know sponsors for twenty thousand dollars each for the year, and I don't know if anybody in in Canadian TV does 
because that. Yeah, I don't. But know. you know, it's, it's it's easy to figure out. That's a gross of two hundred forty thousand mm-hmm. dollars. Okay, so that doesn't keep two people fat and happy. <laughs> and <laughs> the alone, bills paid. Yeah, and the bills paid, and 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 the uh, the uh, you know the spouses and everything else. So uh, we were wanted to, um, I don't know, but year five, six, something like that of of outdoor quest. We'd, uh, the sponsors came to us, you know, and one would be unhappy because half the show was fishing and, and they were hunting and the other half, the other ones would be unhappy because half of it was, was hunting and they were fishing. And that kind of stuff, you know, so it was like, and I thought it was perfect because it, you could guarantee that, that there, there were products were going to be in every show. Right. I mean, it was products that we use. That's one thing we've never done is we've never used junk. We've never sold out. And, uh, I've turned down some, some people that were, were pretty surprised because I just didn't, uh, you know, I didn't see how it could work and it, you'd be faking it. And that's, that's not what our, our, our fans or our viewers uh, watch us for. Mm-hmm. So we come down to the point where, you know, we've, we've we had outdoor quest sold out and we, it you know, that just wasn't enough money anymore. So we, what could we bring another show up o- over? We did, we dropped the fishing out of, out of outdoor quest at year five or six, whatever it was. And I uh, went solely hunting. And so we, we were talking about TJ wanted to bring up another fishing show, but the fishing world is even worse than hunting. It's very saturated. And actually what happened was um, we got to know Gordy Clausen, who is a big name in trapping uh, in Alberta, but he has a, at the time he had a little store just out at DeBolt. And, uh, but he's just a really, he's just a really good guy. Mm-hmm. So we, Richard went trapping with him and we filmed it and the response was overwhelming. We put it on uh, two half, half uh, sections on, on, uh, or half <laughs> episodes on, on outdoor quest. And, and it was off the charts and TJ was flat out against doing it. And I says, well, listen, you know, uh, Gordy might be a sponsor and, and, you know, he's a good guy and it's quality. And, and he says, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I says, but, you know, let's let's give it a try. And about that time, Swamp People was getting big. Oh yeah. And I thought if a guy with suspenders and and one tooth and, and <laughs> <laughs> could gut hook a gator on on TV and 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 be and popular, them. we look we yeah shoot them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were we were playing normal. You know what I mean? And uh, it those two half were just poof just launched and and even at that point they became runaway successes those those two half uh half shows and that and and the the email that it generated like uh uh you know and messages and and stuff like that so i threw a proposal to tj i said let's let's do a trapping show and it you know and sometimes you wonder about you know did you get back on god's side or whatever but everything just fell in our lap yeah we uh we went and did uh i i of course, could have grandfathered in because I trapped as a kid and everything else. But uh, Sandy had never had done any trapping, so we had, took our trapping course uh, at Gordy's and um, on the long weekend in May. And and uh, he got a phone call while we're there, and he says, "Do you want to buy a trap line?" I says, "What?" He says, "Well, this old guy here, he's got you got got to sell his line." I says, yeah, at the time, Gordy was the president of the Alberta Trappers Association, yeah. and right. Um, a lot of people knew him. He just has has been a name in in the trapping world for many many years. And I mean, I I've been trying for years and years and years to buy my own line and and uh, just. But I had it's it's funny. You know, I mean, the things that you do as a kid. I was uh, we had a, a certain area where you hunted moose and you, and uh, you know the areas where you hunt sheep and all that. Those those uh, those rockies, those eastern slopes, and that those foothills are are, are plenty addictive. And and that's where I wanted my trap line. Well this was nowhere near there and which is good because this exact opposite direction (laughs) yeah this this has way more uh species of animals than it would ever get on the well and so it was yeah it was really fortunate then because these um these people he was um i don't want to say it was late stage um alzheimer's but he was very he was a very confused gentleman at the time that we met them so got this phone call. Gordy put us on the phone with these folks. We met them the very next weekend. Um, they were having to sell their farm, the yeah, animals, kind of machinery. Yeah. Um, and then he was going to be um, assessed from a medical perspective. But we went out there and we saw what we saw. And, and it was a little rough that they built a lot of that back in the early 80s. Um, but 
we with other people's junk. <laughs> yeah, well, whatever. Anyway, we yeah uh, we made an offer and they accepted it. But then she started telling us really how sick he was. So we had a lawyer. Uh, we we asked that they get a lawyer, and she yeah. thought that was a good idea. So um, then we talked to the lawyer. The lawyer understood the situation, and he put some pressure on the fish and wildlife folks up here because they're kind of famous for dragging their feet and. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when, when we get to it, we get to it. And, and he put some pressure on just to close the deal for them because they could sure use money. Yeah. 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 And we, yeah. we gave them what they wanted. They, yeah. We gave them what they're, they it asked. wasn't a haggle in the no, place. So no, anyway, yeah. we, so from there, then the show really started to take off. And we, I think it was three years that we, we did both outdoor quest. Um, the hunting. We, we did yeah. half, we, our obligation was to do half the hunting shows um of any one year and then we also did the full 13 seasons uh, or 13 episode seasons for three years with um trapping ink Mm -hmm. and then just got to the point where you know we were still only splitting everything 50 50 but we were doing two-thirds of the work so um we the banker and her came out (laughs) we said (laughs) this doesn't you know i i think it's probably a good time to to go our separate ways outdoor quest was doing really well and they had a direction that they wanted to to move the show to and we really loved doing the trapping so mm-hmm. it was, and it a good was split. amicable oh like yeah. there was there was yeah. no there was no anger crosswords or anything like that yeah. it was just it was time for for something yeah. else and, and uh, it was a that... natural progression yeah, yeah. Say. sounds yeah. like you guys are really almost in the right place right time almost for the right minute uh, by, by the, the sounds of the phone listening. calls and everything yeah <laughs> yeah oh. yeah that's what i was saying it was like it was like god wasn't mad at me anymore or something you know <laughs> and you had to have your well yeah you had to have the trapping course um they were getting quite kind of sticky at that point if uh to be able to own mm-hmm. the trapping you know so it's not just it's not just getting the course. You have to have some years of experience yeah. as well. So they want to make sure that the resource is managed properly. Yeah. And uh, of course, that's always up to someone else's interpretation. Yeah. Um, but it, it all, all the stars aligned and yeah, that's yeah. good. Yeah, I know. I know. You, sorry, go ahead, Tristan. Were you surprised at all, like, at the response of the for for the trapping content? Like, yeah, we were. Yeah. Yeah. We um. Was it first year or second year we get invited like to Vancouver? Um, I think it was at the end of the second year. Um, or we were, just, we were kind of yeah. worried because it was like, you know, that's like anti-central, right? And so we reviewed all of our media training and that kind of stuff, you know, the circular arguments, bring it back around on, keep it on subject because things like this get really emotional in a big hurry, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, and once when, when people are hearing with their heart and not hearing with their ears and, and the best facts or truth or whatever will never overrule emotion so we went there and in one day we shook hands with like a thousand people yeah and it was just wow. they love us they love us and i just we're sitting in the hotel room <laughs> in, our, in our underwear eating pizza that night and i just i said who knew that vancouver was you know like a, a hot bed of trappers <laughs> and she <laughs> laughed she says she says there's something else going on here and you know, over the years, we've we've come to realize that uh, about eighty percent of our uh, of our universe are not trappers, have no connection to trapping. They're but, just well, fascinated they, with the life. They don't mm-hmm. have any personal connection to trapping. They they may have learned about trapping um, as part of social studies when they were in elementary school. They might have had um, a a grandparent or an uncle or someone in their family history who'd been a trapper or who knew about it or bought furs or, you know, any of that kind of stuff. But one of the questions that we got in Vancouver, well, it wasn't really a question. It was, I didn't know it was still legal. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we kind of took that as, as being our little flag to fly, I guess, to, to make sure that people understood that this is still a way of life. There are still people who earn Maybe they don't earn their entire living from trapping, but it's still a very viable ocup- occupation, and it's still very much needed. Oh yeah, um, in the conservation landscape. It's Actually, interesting. Probably- yeah, I was just gonna say it's interesting because, like, it I, when I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here. When I think of like um, hunting in the media, like there's obviously factions out there that aren't fans of hunters mm-hmm. or, or the hunting lifestyle, but yeah. I, I feel like that the pressure is even 
increase more on trapping in some ways too. Like there's been um, more um, kind of critical lens focused in on is trapping ethical things like this. But it seems like what you've managed to tap into is the the flip side of that coin is that there's a lot of people that are just curious about trapping and like they what are. it is. And yeah, what it and means. I would I would say that our our show probably um, borders on a documentary type of. Entertainment. Uh, entertainment yeah when i said that the 80 percent had no connection every one of us has the connection to trapping it is hardwired in our primordial self mm. it's no different than than hunting fishing breathing or chasing women i don't do that yeah i know <laughs> <laughs> well we we wouldn't judge either way so like, <laughs> Thank see you. he's not judging he's no, not, I, not, I, I knew that right away when i saw him <laughs> <laughs> yeah. anyway it, it, that is something that is deeply rooted and it's really funny because in today's world uh trapping is probably more important than it's ever been and that's because of adc work right you know the problems we have with beavers you know uh, that is just employs a lot of people we do a lot of uh, on our podcast we do a lot of uh talk with adc people in new york and and uh and Toronto and you name it, all those big cities and, and squirrels and raccoons pay the pay the bill. That one mm. when you get far enough south then groundhogs. Yeah. Yeah. And groundhogs in, are big. In deal. places like Edmonton and Calgary, it's um kites. kites. Yeah. And attacking people in the on the walking trails and so on, right? Mm-hmm. So, so it, it used to be that the trapper yeah. made a living on it on his fur and then he did he did side jobs, you know, uh, ADC work and that. and now today it's like they are hard, there's lots of mm-hmm. hardcore uh, full-time uh, ADC people and uh, you know they, they still do some some uh, wildland trapping uh, on, on the side. It is a very important conservation tool but uh, probably the smartest thing we ever did was when uh, the uh, European Union came to us and said you, you can't we're you not guys gonna are buy cool. your fur. you can't have your fur here any, anymore and we said okay tell us what's humane and so they that's where the agreement for international uh, humane uh, trapping standards came about. He is, and they we let them define it. But think, think about this: like what a what a jackpot we could have been in. But we let them define what was humane. You know, like for something like a martin, it has to be dead in in uh, yeah in one hundred and twenty seconds. One hundred twenty seconds. You know, uh, a beaver uh, up to up to five minutes. Uh, 300, 300 seconds. Yeah, you know, and so I mean, w- which are. are very very short spans uh, of time we may we let let them define what was going to be humane that they would accept and then we we met it and we that's where we actually body, exceeded it yeah well that's yeah. where the body grip traps come from and the finest body grip traps uh in the world are made in canada strictly because we have to use these certified traps right mm-hmm. there are a lot of like even uh, some of the actual conibear which most people know what a conibear is a 330 or 120 or whatever that's a body grip trap there are um, of the Conor Bear brand. There are some of them that are, aren't legal in Canada because they've never been certified. They don't meet the the standard. But the Belial, the Savage, the uh, LDL, uh, the Rudy, those are four uh, Canadian brands. Those are the finest in in the world. And because we met all of that, they have a hard time now attacking us because we are by their definition, and they wrote the definition. We yeah. are humane. So know? trapping in Canada is continuously evolving here it's continued to evolve um Correct. but one thing i really noticed too when watching trapping inc and uh you know reading some of the materials is that it, it really also highlights a couple other items which is like the heritage and tradition of of trapping in canada and that's that's a deeply rooted canadian story too can you like say a little bit more about what it what trapping means to canada and like our history here it, it trapping found canada founded canada i mean yeah. By the by, the uh, middle 1600s, the beaver were were wiped out across most of, of Europe. Uh, actually, about 1620 or whatever, beaver were gone, and it was it was beaver. What it was was <laughs> it's embarrassing too because it was guys, but it was fashion, and it was <laughs> uh, it was hats. Okay, a felt hat, and mm-hmm. beaver makes the finest felt hat because of the way the the uh, uh, the fine barbs on the on the hair interlocks when, when they make it into felt, and the um, Swedes had this one particular hat where the brim was wider than their shoulders. Like it came off their head and then this big wide brim and only beaver could pull it off. Well, that became a rage and they discovered there were beaver over here. Beaver are what, what opened up North America. You know, that's, that's what, what was the making of, of Canada with all of 
the the exploration, uh, you know, all the great uh, uh, the explorers, voyagers. the voyagers, you know, that you know about, and and uh, but the lakes and rivers and all that named that, that that's what they were doing. They were they were out here exploring Canada and they were making maps and and uh, uh, you know killing and, beaver, killing beaver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's crazy to think about. And and now nowadays, what what uh, what do you get for a beaver compared to like other furs? Well, you know, you, you're getting right now. Actually, you you get the same that you always got for beaver, thirty to forty bucks for a good winter beaver, like a blanket beaver. Mm -hmm. You'll get thirty to forty bucks, but it's what got to be one that was taken through the ice, uh, and it's for felting. Once again, they're they're gonna either for shearing or for felting. Okay, shearing is when they they take and remove the guard hairs and all that, and you're you're left with what looks like half inch crushed velvet, like honest. To, God, we're it just is. missing a picture of Elvis yeah. on it. Is all you're missing. It's just, yeah. it's just gorgeous. <laughs> it is. We have Sandy. Uh, we made a, a blanket for for Sandy's uh, bed. I can sleep there too. But, <laughs> 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 but it's made out of out of 20, 20 beaver that we caught through the ice, and it is just the most glorious thing ever. The biggest problem with beaver and why they're not more popular with uh, with as fur coats now is the weight. Right, they're yeah. heavy. Heavy. Okay, it's yeah. it's heavy, and that's why Martin is so so incredibly popular. Is that it's really really light. Mm -hmm. Well, so, and you can't ranch beaver either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You might get some interesting guests showing up to the beaver ranch. Oh, you might. Yeah, you might. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, that's for, for sure. sure. Uh, but, can I can I ask some yeah. specifics about the uh, the trap line itself? Because yep, you you, you, you purchased this thing a few years back. Um, how yep. big is the trap line? They vary. The average trap line in Alberta is about two townships. Do you know what a township is? Not off the top of my head, no. Six miles by six miles. Six by six, Kim. Okay. All of all of Canada is laid out in 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 the grid system. We have uh, yep. range roads and, and townships. Okay. Yeah. Same. It's it breaks down to that, and there are what thirty six sections in a township. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway. Um, so when you buy, so just. Just to clarify, when you buy um, a trap line, it's actually called a registered fur management area. And you it is crown land. So you don't actually buy the property. You just no. buy the exclusive rights to trap mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. not to hunt or to fish or anything else, only to trap. Yep. And then you buy with, with the funds or with the sum that's offered or whatever is also includes improvements so that would be your cabin um you know perhaps a snowmobile or a quad or traps or a canoe i like it could be anything there's no real real fine definition of what improvement includes but um but really what you've got is the exclusive rights to trap yeah and um like i say the average in alberta is two townships some are as small as one township uh, one is as large as 30 townships Ooh. Ours is four townships, so twelve by twelve, twelve and it's miles by twelve perfectly miles. square, which is unusual. Square too. miles, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've I've looked at quite a few uh, registered trap lines in Manitoba here, and they're they're definitely not square. They're like squigglies all over the place. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot of them follow um, maybe river systems yeah. or that kind of thing. Yeah, right? I'm kind we, of. We um, ours ours butts up against two um, Métis uh, settlements. Settlements. Uh, Peavine is our uh, settlement is our south south neighbor and uh, gift lake is our is our east neighbor interesting so that that helped part with the, part with the square stuff <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah i'm i'm interested in uh in kind of the the development of the trap line as well um you know you guys you guys get this new trap line you said uh there's some work to do by the sounds of it but when you guys got it can you can you give us a little bit of walkthrough of like how did that look for you guys and how did that that trap line develop so I, i'm like i'm imagining some people thinking that you just get on this trap line throw some traps and you got sleighs full of furs in the back kind of thing and off you go to the, <laughs> well, the fur auction so but. one of the really fun things that happened when we first got there and got the keys was we walked into the <laughs> walked into the skinning shed um with uh, I don't even think you had a flashlight with no, you. No, no. Um, turned a flashlight on or turned a light on somewhere, realized he it was kind of like Bugs Bunny. He'd, he'd walk through all these set traps. The guy <laughs> had left these set traps in pails. Booby but traps? But they were, t they were tipped over, like body grip oh. traps. Like 330s. 330s. The, yeah. They would break a bone. 
right? So. <laughs> well, not really. You, you cry a lot and claim you broke a bowl, but then you, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> You're not laughing anyway. So that was, um, that Bill was kind of was our... really sick. Yeah, he was. He was really sick. Yeah. And then we found traps. He left traps out in the bush and that one fisher box and and yeah. the, the trap was fired in and I tilted over and, and a, a skull rolls out of it, you know, like, mm -hmm. so it killed something and went to a it, it was good that his wife recognized yeah. um, that his, the disease had progressed to the point where he wasn't going to be able to um, function normally or what we would consider normally, I guess. But in the, in the meantime, though, I don't think they had spent as much time out in, out there no. as, as well, they might have claimed. We have four quota animals in Alberta. So uh, Fisher, Wolverine, uh, Otter, and Lynx are quota animals. And I'm only allowed a certain number, or we're, we're only allowed a certain number on our trap line. And we have to register each one that we get every year. And the quota animals had quit on his reports. They'd only go back five years, uh, like I wanted the fur reports on, on the trap line, just Get my, give, give some idea what's going on, right? right? I mean, research is everything. And so I, I, I check into it and he hadn't registered a quota animal in, five, in that five year span. And the beaver, number of beaver had just kept going up every year, every year, every year, and until it was like 97 or something on the, on the last year. And so I knew his son was filling it out, just fudging it all, all completely, but nobody was checking or, or catching up. So yeah. he, he was sick and, and uh, when it comes to though taking on a trap line like that, there's an immense amount of work. Not to mention all the work on the cabin, the cabins that we did, but um, the trails. Like we have, uh, I go out there. We go out there every four days, spend spend three days on it. And when we've got the wolf wolf sets are out and the lynx sets are up and everything else, uh, you know, I do 300 kilometers in in the three days. And the whole idea of people say, but it's only 12 by 12. But you got to remember that you want to have a set you know like for martin every quarter mile so you know you, you put one here well quarter mile that way that way whatever you could do in so good habitat like mm -hmm. it's not yeah. just that yeah. all over the trap line right but then it's figuring out because we didn't know the, no. the the property at all so we spent you know a, a few years just figuring out where everything was and it's very wet out there so the immense um, amount of trail yeah. work uh you you just you just I've ran the chainsaw. I've, <laughs> I I did all my work. This is three years ago. I did all all, all the work. We we got out and it was it was like this a dry summer, and we got out there and we'd done a bunch in the in the, the summertime. We had all our trails cleared and everything. It was Weren't just we great. smart? Oh yeah. <laughs> the last week of uh, October, we got like uh, a foot and a half of wet snow. Wow, you know what that does? Ooh, and yeah. you still got leaves on, right? Some of the the poplar and all that have leaves on. But what's worse are those swamp spruce. And they all go down yeah. like this, and then they freeze down, and they all you know they're so brushy, and that's so. So you got to not only just you know cut the trunk off, but you got to limit on the way to throw it out of the way, right? I I was <laughs> looking to hire what uh, rent one of my grandchildren to drive the the Argo because I had one 11 kilometer stretch that I literally walked all the way with the chainsaw and then walk back to the Argo to, to you know, every 300 yards, you walk back to Argo, move the Argo up. And it, was just, it was just a disaster. But you have all these trails that you got to figure out. You got to figure out where your animals are. We get a lot of questions from people who want to trap and, or have a, a you know, a trap line or whatever. And they ask you things like, where should I put my Martin trap? Where should I put a, a kite snare? That kind of stuff. And my, always my first answer is, is how well do you know your line? And I, I, I get that a lot of people think that's a cop out, but I mean, I know where the otters are going to cross. I know where the lynx are going to come from. I, I know all of that stuff, where to put the wolf baits, yeah. you know, all that kind of stuff. But that's because I know the place. And, I, and you mm -hmm. know, I've got, I don't know, between the two snowmobiles, uh, there's over 20,000 kilometers in six years on that line. Yeah. And, and you know, then another, I don't know, probably four or 6,000 kilometers on Argos in, in that time. And, you know, it's just because you spend the time there and you pay attention. And, and I mean, snow in the wintertime, we're, we're always, we always have snow here. That's like every day, like getting the newspaper because it's, you're, you're learning something every day, you know, yeah. and it reinforces where the good places are, where animals are, are, are crossing, that kind of thing. Sometimes, you know, I just, I was just talking with a guy through, through Google translate. Uh, he's in Siberia and he's, he's getting into uh trapping uh, uh, martin and so he wanted my martin lure recipe and then he wanted uh uh you know how close you put your martin traps and it's like well sometimes two on one tree you know and you know they look at you like well yeah but if you know it's a place like 
you know, there's there's a couple spots that we've got where when they when the young disperse in the fall and they they disperse start you know sometimes in October most time that first week or two of November is when the young martin are, are dispersing and they move there'll be a couple of them traveling together and so uh, if you happen to know where where it's happened before like if you ever come up on a uh, on a uh, a martin and uh, hanging in a trap and and the box has been tore open and, and the uh, the bait taken out and that you know there's another one with them those are the kind of places that you pay attention to it happens another time well they're going to put a second trap there some places you know you you might go miles without having put a trap in and, and other places you put a trap in just because the habitat looks right and you haven't put a trap in for a while <laughs> and you really need a trap there to keep you awake when you're checking in the middle of the night <laughs> oh that's good there's bridges to build there's and sometimes rebuild and, and rebuild, rebuild again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's a, an immense amount of work to it. But I think that nothing can replace your time on the trap line. That's that's the most important thing, learning those animals. Because as, as good as you think you are, I just did a, a uh, I'm, I'm editing here on uh, the other computer, and I we call it uh, the cutting room floor. It's it's what I ever have left over on, on every year. And, and uh this was on on an otter and literally i had otter sets you know uh on one was on on the one side of the bridge and the other was was 100 yards on the other side of the bridge and you know i was one side i was i was the windshield and the other side i was the bug right and it was <laughs> say you know it was it was otter but you you just you can't make them do what what you want them to but you, you can sure take advantage of of you know their their habits right mm -hmm. so how many days a year do you think you spend out obviously you're you're on the more committed end of trapping here how many days a year are you out on that trap line would you say well over um, 120 yeah probably yeah yeah i would say so i mean there's there's times that weather just dictates that you don't go for safety sake um mm -hmm. yeah. if nothing else and um you know there's like lots of times we'll spend more of a summer out there if we if we have a project that needs to be done, a roof mm -hmm. that needs to be done or something like that, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll spend more time out there. But, um, you know, I, I would say at least 120 days Yeah, yeah, yeah. on average. And I mean, there's more. so much stuff that you do in the summer. That's when you, you might, cause you know, the spring, springtime is a good time for to, to lose a bridge or two. So then you, you'll build uh, bridges in, in the summer. You got to do, get all that wood in. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. I've been with people. I went out trapping on the trap lines, and, and what's the first thing we do? We get there in the, in the dark and time to start a fire. Well, we got to go cut some wood. What? There's <laughs> no time for that. We're supposed to be trapping, you know? <laughs> yeah. So you yeah. you you really kind of set yourself up in a situation that when a time when crunch time comes, snow's flying, um, the the coats are getting thick on the animals. You're a hundred percent focused on putting animals in traps pretty much yep yeah absolutely yep. yeah yeah and it, it's a big setup it takes because we can't um beaver beaver muskrat uh coyote wolf and fox all open on the first of october but i do muskrat the last we like to do the last um, start maybe in the middle of october we like to get that's uh, not true he <laughs> always takes me on an anniversary cruise for muskrat <laughs> <laughs> and that's when they sing yeah. <laughs> that's the canoe cruise yeah <laughs> oh, you should see the cruise yeah. we have this old canoe that's been patched many times we call it the wreck of the hesperus <laughs> and we get out into some thank god shallow water but you can't walk in it because it, the bottom is so mucky mucky that you, you you just can't get your feet in and out of the muck so we kind of drag ourselves in the canoe across shallow yeah. water so depending on weather in october we start on our muskrat uh my beaver i like beaver you need for bait mm -hmm. everything eats beaver that's not a joke <laughs> 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 oh yes <laughs> i know i'm trying to keep our pg rating here. Right. come on come on <laughs> a anyway uh I'll, I'll get my beaver in the either uh in the winter or in the spring and i, I mean a lot of beaver gets sold for uh for bear bait but uh, i always take care of, of of what i need for bait myself and i've probably got I don't know, 150 pounds out there they're all chopped up in, into uh, fist-sized chunks and frozen in uh in tubs and that but 
So I do muskrat, and that kind of gets everything ready, kind of gets the knocks the rest off the stuff. Yeah, you're, well, you're, you're, muskrat makes a good bait too, but I mean, it just gets gets the ring rust out of on me, and, <laughs> and, the, and this and the, the you know, <laughs> knife get the knives sharp, and we get fur working and all that kind of stuff. And, and then November one is the first day that uh, Martin Fisher, Wolverine, Ermine, Mink, they all open on that day, yeah. and so that's the first day I can set, and it takes about two, two maybe two and a half weeks to get that yeah, all set. At least we Thank have you. we have about three hundred boxes out in the bush, give or oh, take. How many and the squirrels and bears well, ate this year? But there's the grizzly bear that roams around there, and he just likes <laughs> oh. to swat them off the tree. Yeah. Jeez. And goodness knows where you but you might find it still intact, um, or he might have just stomped on it. Yeah. So. Yeah, but it, they, you get get that all set up, and then the first of uh, December, uh, Lynx and Otter open, and I don't usually take after Otter then. Oh, in between though, in November, I, that's when I start out on uh, on wolves and kites, and uh, that's a ton of bait that is. Yeah, and out there is tough because, you know, you need to uh, you got to use roadkill, so you got to drive around finding roadkill. You got to have a a permit to pick up roadkill and you gotta it has to be in your area yeah in your area and that because that of cwd of and all that, uh, that kind of stuff <clears throat> you get that going and then then you start hanging snares and this it's a busy 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 time um christmas time is about the time that i get to open up the the, the far south yeah the far southeast uh, uh south, and southwest. that's easier to do with a snowmobile yeah um because then you can go straight from the cabin you don't have to load anything up in the trailer and drive all that way because it's, it's always cross country it's always safe other than the one time i went swimming <laughs> safe except for the one time mm. <laughs> and so then you go you get get out there and get all the links lines set up and uh, we'll have 140 or 150 uh, martin fisher uh mink ermine and uh and wolverine sets out and on I think last year I ran 67 or 68 pens for lynx and then a bunch of blind sets on trails. Mm -hmm. um, my average wolf bait starts with about a dozen snares on it. And then, it, you know, if, if I'm catching, you'll add more or if they come in and they, they didn't come in the way I expected, you'll add more, mm -hmm. sometimes up to two dozen, whatever. But yeah, that's a lot yeah, of work. Kind of ultra. What's that? It's a, it's a lot of work to set up, and then I think I think one thing that's that's uh, I mean, you guys don't really mention, or maybe people aren't thinking about, but you also have to check these things frequently, right, to make sure yeah you are catching them well, on birds. And... Most of our most of our traps are killing traps. Yeah. So in in Alberta, we can snare to kill, not snare to hold. Right. Um, we don't do much with footholds. Only because there is a uh, there's a check time limit there, yeah, right? So if we can't meet that check time limit, we don't we don't push anything. So everything is a killing trap. The only thing that we could that we could uh, use footholds on is the canines, mm -hmm. fox, coyote, and wolf, and and the lynx. That's well, it. we can use them on muskrat under. Oh yeah, yeah, but yeah, that, that, that's a drowning set once again. Yeah. So that's that it's you don't there set. is no check law on that. Yeah. Is there is there a species you prefer to target over like most of the other ones, or is there like are they all kind of like on the same level, and do they all have their own kind of draw? Well, it's <laughs> funny because I always talk about this on on the show is that we run into people who have an animal, okay, Morley Morley Smith, yeah, he's, he's the, wolf, the guy. wolf guy, yeah, uh, you know, and and uh, Ryan Demchinsky has got coyotes nailed and raccoons nailed, yeah, and skunks, and, of course, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's other people you know that were were links and i guess i'm about the only otter guy aren't i i think so yeah. yeah but i i like to 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 say that we get to we get to deal with the experts you know we're, we're not necessarily the expert but we can get to learn from them uh, what i deem an expert is when they're talking to you and and you make oh like the shobs and wolverine yeah Okay, yes. so we're up there doing Wolverine. We're in the far northwest corner of Alberta doing Wolverine with uh, Re uh, Rennie Schaub and Kevin Schaub and what Ke was the son, son? Kevin and Joni's kids. Yeah, what, what was the boy's name? Oh shoot, now I'm going to be embarrassed. I can't remember his name. Anyway, they uh, 
one of the cool things is, is that you, you have a big uh, a bait pile for wolves, right? You'd have a bait pile for wolves and the wolverine would move in on. Well, when wolverine moves in on, uh, on a bait pile, they pee on everything, okay? They pee on it and they smell. Mm-hmm. They're a weasel, they smell. And so then they would, they would set a, uh, a wolverine uh, a pen there for them. And he says, well, we just take, take a, a nice chunk of the, of the bait over there that they, they peed all over and we'll throw it in, in, back in the pen. And I looked at him and I says, so why didn't you put fresh stuff back in the pen? He says, well, he says, because the Wolverine's already claimed what's been peed on. And if you take and move it, he's got to get it back. And hmm. he'll charge right through that. And instantly I knew he was right, that they, they had read that animal's mind, so to speak. I knew instantly that he was right. And and instantly that I, I said to him, I said, I, I would have never made that leap of uh, that intuition. You know, I, I said, uh, as soon as you say it to me, I know you're right. I said, I'd have been putting fresh stuff in there. And he looked at me and he grinned. He says, for years, we did put fresh stuff in there. <laughs> <laughs> so. uh, trappers are innovative and they're always trying to think about yeah. what what's missing. Like why about connecting the dots and, you know, why isn't something coming in that, you know, you would think would be so then you try something different well mm-hmm. morley uh came up to my trap land we were setting up wolves and he has particular spots where he wants to put a wolf satin and as soon as he talks about it, like he, he likes to have it down on an open you know like down a hill on an uh, on an opening or out on the water but downhill so he says he says i want them going downhill he says because they're looking over top of what's in front of them at what what's out on the lake or out on the out in the middle of the meadow he says they run right into the snare because they're not looking at that, uh, not looking right in front of them if they were on the flat, right? Right. And it's like, oh, instantly that was right. And there was this one little uh, narrow little point of trees that went down. And it was, you know, like a handful of, of spruce trees. And there was right at the end of it, there was there was two about that bit, you know, with a three, four inch stump on, on the bottom. And, and they kind of made a shade. But he says, he says, right here, he says, if we were going to set any footholds, this is where you'd set it. There's a couple logs laying there. He says, we put it right in between these two logs. He says, I said, well, how do you know that right here? You know, because there's no traction or nothing. You're, you're literally bringing in the bait and everything and you're just setting up. He says, because the young ones, he says, the pups, he says, they're going to they're gonna go steal some bait. And he says, they're going to be want to be here where they can watch anybody else and they can eat it, but they're hidden. And it's like, ha. Huh. And when the, when the wolves came through and, and, uh, and we filled the stairs and that, one had actually walked through there right exactly where he said that that trap should be. Hmm. It was just amazing. It's like he understood them so much, you know, with, with wolves, it isn't so much that they're this Uber incredibly intelligent. They're really, really good at noticing what's changed. Um, you know, uh, you know, that kid's game, find Waldo yeah. Wolf could win that every time. Like, I mean, they're just, they're just remarkable that way. And, and the thing is, uh, I think that a, a lone coyote out in the, up in the big bush is harder to catch than a wolf because a wolf is all about the pack and that the dynamics of that pack and the interaction of the pack is constantly has them distracted. You know, you'll be going along and uh, the wolves will get on, on your trail and that, and you won't go very far. And all of a sudden there'd be a big dent in the snow off the side and all that. And you know, one wolf would push the other wolf over. This is the young guys wrestling or, or the less dominant ones wrestling, but they're trying to change their position in the pack. Well, that's all distracting. That's all distracting. And if they're doing something like that, as they stumble into where, where, where my snares or whatever are, they, you take advantage of that stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and that was what he said to, said to me was, he says, the most important thing, he says, is you have to have to understand how dominance works in, in a wolf pack and, and that they're always shifting, trying to shift their place in the pack. Oh, that, yeah, you can really see how someone who spent so much time immersed in that, in that kind of environment yeah. just has us almost an intuition about how those those animals can behave but to be able <laughs> to true. explain it so concisely too is impressive um yeah. i'm curious about some of the gear because I, I was watching some of the videos and um i know i did notice some of the gear so i wanted to pick your brain on it you you too like to use a uh, argo uh and i know in manitoba like a sled like a snowmobile is a very popular trap uh yeah trapping device but the you lean on the argo quite heavily i would say uh compared to manitoba here is there is there a reason for that well we we do for part of the season but snowmobile features um quite prominent we we don't show the snowmobile probably as much 
Um, but the Argo is is almost an essential tool out there oh, just essential. because it's so wet. And it's and, such a workhorse. Yeah. yeah. And we can carry so much gear in it, as well as I stay dry and warm. <laughs> it's very important. <laughs> she, she told me she'd go with, she'd follow me anywhere in the world as long as I kept her warm. I've taken that serious for 40 some years now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I I can see how indispensable it would be because you you were cutting firewood with it too, right? So like yeah. to to think about summer access, the, it seems like you you were explaining where you're cutting that uh, that beetled pine. Um, yeah. There might not be no other access and with an Argo, right? So um, well, but in this in this case there isn't because we have to cross two beaver dams in and in the summer they're full of water so safest beaver dam uh, safest beavers on the face of the earth yeah but they they, they maintain the dams that you have to cross to get to our cabin uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. well it's just you know we don't have any I, I wouldn't say we've had ever any trouble uh we're we're out in the middle of nowhere um but still people will find you if yeah. if they want to but we um we just you know if you make it more difficult, then people aren't going to make a highway into your place. Right. Mm-hmm. right. The, th- the thing about the Argo is, is that it allows us to get going a lot earlier than we would otherwise. Yeah. You don't often have yeah. snow, you know, I, okay. One year out of, uh, out of, uh, out of eight or whatever, you'd have good snow in November. Otherwise you're not going to have enough snow for a snowmobile in, uh, until end of December. Well, you just gave up a really important month. Uh, also, when you're when you're doing that early uh, season stuff, you fall through with an Argo. Well, that's you're just a cork. You got nothing to worry about. It's a little more tense when the snowmobile goes down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. More of an and ice it, cube it, than a cork. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. And and there's there's uh, you know so much to be hauling all the time. Uh, you know, in addition to all, everything that every other trapper has to haul, we have to haul our our, our camera, camera gear, gear and everything. And man, let me tell you, to keep that stuff, uh, you know warm and dry and and uh and clean batteries oh just you know what it's like you, you, if you hunt you go out and, and uh you have a, a day out there and it, and it's like you it's snowing all day long there's a little bit of snow on the trees the leaves and that and you're walking through it and you're just soaked mm-hmm. all, the, all day long well imagine that now you go out and you, and you do you know 100 or 200 kilometers in a day and, and you're hitting all those willows and trees in front of you with the machine that Having a windshield and a top is just priceless. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. You know? So, yeah. and and when we start early, the thing that we have to carry the most is um, uh, we have to carry a lot of boxes. So we hook a, a trailer on behind to haul extra boxes. You know, on an average, we probably lose 10% a year to, to squirrels and bears. So even that's 30 boxes, you know? And uh, then when you're setting up those, those baits, you know, you got to haul in a, a moose or whatever. Well, that goes into the trailer as mm-hmm. well. And, goes up to gets gets dumped and um it's just it's the workhorse there's just nothing nothing compares you know we don't we don't have uh much for road access and you know none that none that would do us any good so yeah Yeah. it's a very important tool to us workhorse is coming through loud and clear there and i i've always been nervous crossing i don't i don't know if zach or not but i've always been nervous crossing swamps in the winter because i feel like they freeze a little differently than like a, a lake would like there can yeah. be some hot spots in the swamp because the the vegetation decays and yeah. maybe there's a spring there that you don't know about um i'm not sure um but we have a lot of muskeg where we okay. are so yeah. um even sometimes in the winter it can be soft right mm-hmm. so, yeah. and if you want to sleep even less <laughs> just take a look see if you see any otter tracks because if there's an otter out you can go swimming oh, <laughs> I, yeah. I, I get it i get a on average two unscheduled baths a winter from from following otter but it is <laughs> just exactly what you're talking about there where you'll have a a body of water here a little lake or whatever then there's that that muskeg in between and then maybe there's a creek or a beaver pond or another little lake well that water does actually flow in between but for a lot of time, it's it, we don't even know it's there. But as soon as an otter goes through there, he will be on top of the uh, of the ice or on top of the the ground, and he'll follow the actual. I, they must must hear it, but he will follow the actual course of it, and they do it year after year after year. Like I mean, I didn't realize they were following the actual course and or, or the actual what it, where it was actually running until you know having watched it for years and trapping in the same places. We we'll, we'll trap them above uh, on top of the on top of the ice in those spots where. And you don't even know there's ice there until you try to set a stake for, for to hold your your trap or whatever. 
so you're you're correct, but I mean, if you want to go swimming, just go walk around following an <laughs> otter. Because what he's doing is he's going from one weak spot to another, trying to find a way to get back under. I always thought that was the bravest thing on the face of the earth. You'd come up to a, a beaver dam, and an otter would come up over the beaver dam, and he'd dig around, find a place to dive in, and under the icy wind. I always thought that was so brave. And <laughs> guy told me he says, "Why?" He says he's not a prisoner under there. He knows how to get back out. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Always yeah. put that little human quality to, to things, right? Yeah, I've I've followed some otter tracks before down a creek, and and uh, just how they move, like in and out of the the like jagged ice and stuff, and how they're they're in there, and they like you said, they find the spots to go in, and you're just like, how the why would they even how would they get in there, and how would they trust that they they can get in there and exactly. not get stuck or something like that? It just blows my mind. The yeah. first thing I learned from Otter was that at the end of every beaver dam, you know, you got your you got a beaver dam and the house is sitting and maybe in the middle of whatever. But at, at, where that beaver dam hits uh, hits the bank, just about invariably that the, they have a, de- a bank down there. And how I thought figured that out was because otters will go there, dig under the snow, they'll dig their way into that dam or into that den and uh, that hole and get under the ice. And they're not after beaver, but they're after, you know, in our case, case of our craft line, it's all minnows, stickleback minnows and all that. But I mean, I never really thought about their, you know, after you, you see them drained and that, you, oh yeah, there's, there's, there's a, a dam there and that, but you watch where the, where, around a beaver dam, you watch wherever the otter goes because, you know, that's, the, there's going to be a, a beaver access there, that kind of stuff. Fascinating animals to watch. I, well, I kind of thought when you guys were talking about your five questions, that'd be one of the questions would be, you know, which animal has the best PR firm and it's the otter there is <laughs> there is nothing more utterly ruthless than an otter like I mean they are a carnivore uh musclehead so they're all members of the weasel family all of all of them skunks otters wolverine mm-hmm. martin mink everything they're all, all but they look so cute and yeah. everybody thinks yeah. oh they just love one as yeah. a pet and I'm like mm-hmm. they are the fattest animal out there fatter than beaver wow. and when you're a carnivore and you're fat you're real good at what you do. Yeah. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> that's interesting. That's that's one way to put it for sure. I had a prof that would always say that uh, uh, squirrels were just rats with good PR. It's kind of funny to think about animals <laughs> in, in, in PR terms. Uh, it's true. <laughs> I, I I noticed that the um, the drone was also playing a, a bit of a role too in what you're doing, and I could I could imagine that that would be super helpful in really rough terrain we have to be careful in manitoba we can't really use it for hunting so much but for for trapping it was interesting to see um just how you were analyzing the topography and like the the tree line and things like that to kind of guide where you were setting up these traps things like that um i used the drone to show what i knew knew of the land i already knew about it uh, that was from my time on the on the trap right. line. The drone drone never factors into trapping whatsoever. Okay. Factors into a TV show. <laughs> okay, it's yeah. cool, right? <laughs> so it become becomes an educational tool. Well, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's another one of those tools. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and it's nice to show a bit of the terrain where you've probably seen where we where we pull all of our our wood from, and as we're pulling that big trailer full of wood and stuff like that, it's kind of cool. But I mean, drones are just like to me, I guess there are commercial models that are, are useful. They're all still line of sight. I mean, I've, I have a friend that owns a, a company and that's what they do. They, they do uh, pipeline maintenance and that kind of stuff. They surveil and he's, you know, drones, but they're still line of sight. You know, he mm-hmm. says you get in a helicopter and we can go wherever and get job done much quicker, that kind of stuff. So, I mean, I don't see them being useful for, for, for those kind of situations. They're, they're really cool. They add a really neat dimension to a TV show, but uh, they, that battery has to be at 20 degrees in order to work. There are very few places in the middle of winter where a battery can be kept at 20 degrees. <laughs> the sky Don't... not being one of them. Yeah. <laughs> Think armpit. Yeah. yeah. Well, or, or warmer spots. Don't touch my batteries. <laughs> <laughs> uh. That's good. Thanks for clarifying that too. That makes a lot more sense now too, because I was curious about that, but it was really helpful for me even just to see as a, like a, as someone who doesn't trap a lot, how th- those funnels work. Cause we use them in hunting too, for like, well, funnels that is yeah. Um, yeah. for, for where we'll set stands and stuff. But the, to think of trapping in that terms is super helpful. 
Um, the the show itself, uh, you know, Trapping Inc. also kind of markets itself as a, a no BS show. There's you know that's very straightforward and um, and uh, to the point. Um, not not injecting any drama, but I know just being in the bush, there's there's always close calls and things like that that happen. You've mentioned going through the ice numerous times. Like, is there any of that kind of pop front of mind when you think about like close calls that you've had out in that bush? Because it's I'm guessing it's a big bush too, right? So um nine one one. Oh, there aren't not... very many people around. Yeah. Um uh and and being prepared is a big part of the game, right? Like you you don't want to be wandering around out there without a purpose and without a, a way to communicate. So we do we we have a just when it, he'll send a text and in the text, he'll say, well, you know, 215, all's good. But when he, when he pushes the button to send it, he might not have any coverage, but mm. at least I know when I get that text, even if I get it at four o'clock in the afternoon, I know at 215, he was fine. Mm-hmm. Right. We so, did have a situation like that. We did have a situation <laughs> like that. Yeah. And it's, it, it's uncomfortable when stuff happens that, you know, and, and we were, there's just the two of us. And lots of times he's out there by himself, particularly in the winter time, because I don't like to be cold. So <laughs> I usually stay at the cabin when it's, when it's winter. And when we're just traveling. Supper is always hot when I get home. Exactly. <laughs> but you know, it, um, you do have to be really careful and very aware. And that's why we don't have these you know, big dramatic moments on the show where, oh my God, we've gone through the ice because first of all, we don't create drama. There's enough of it out there without us doing that. And secondly, you'd have to. If you're seeing somebody in trouble like that, it's they've either got a, uh, a discovery channel type crew there or it's all reenacted. Yeah. yeah, like uh, we, we've had situations where we went through the ice and, and where we've had, situ- you know, uh, where machine was going down or whatever. There's no time to be filming. Mm-hmm. There's just time to get stuff done. And that's that's what just kicks in. You never think about it, you know, the, uh, about about filming it because, it, you know, the, it's crucial that, that you know, the gear, the, all that stuff survives. And and the other side of it is, is that we like to survive, too. Not yeah. Just <laughs> clarify that sometimes sometimes you have an oops happen right and you know you know, you look at it later and and, it, and it's like well why did you do that that was just bloody stupid right but it never it never gets filmed and it, it never gets showed and, and i guess in some ways i mean you, you you could show it but it's just not part of our our, our makeup we want we don't want to ever confuse anybody we, we want to, to to understand you know that we're we're always paying attention and and uh, that we're always trying to do the best I think the biggest thing when you're out there is you don't lose your head. Yeah. I uh, severely cut myself uh, four winters ago, five, winters, yeah. four, four, like really, really bad, right, right across the wrist with a, with a, with a very sharp ax. And there was just blood splurting everywhere. And I was nine kilometers from the, from the uh, cabin. And it was like instantly, you know, I had to, I had to pack it down with, with uh, ice and snow hold hold it with my hand and you know try to get it numbed and slowed down and i did that i uh uh had some um electrical tape and i could, I could use it for make a compression bandage and and uh you know kind of a, a tourniquet now i now i carry a tourniquet and i carry a, a surgical stapler um and I've, I've had to use it once let me tell you what the first one's the worst. <laughs> it, it's it's kind of like a dog bite. It's it's the it's the it's the anticipation, <laughs> especially when you do it to yourself. Uh, you know, you, you just you got to keep your head. Uh, I had to um, I had to get that all under control. I had to be able to. I was on a snowmobile. I had to drive out of there. Mm-hmm. I had to drive out of there. I had to drive nine kilometers back. Uh, actually, I got to. I stopped at the truck, mm-hmm. and I had crazy glue in the truck, and I. I thought it in the general thaw all spot that everybody has, <laughs> and, and I and I glued my I glued my my wrist back together, and and then then we could I got her and and we had it taken care of. But you can't lose your head. Yeah, you always have to be aware. I think I think that's, I mean, when when people think about going and camping and doing this backcountry stuff, and it's it's all, you know, everything's great when everything's going great. But even something small can 
make uh an amazing experience just go south really fast and and you're you're and the story you just explained is actually quite severe you know getting an axe in the wrist anywhere is is not fun at all but um i i think not only like you said there not only being prepared um with gear but mentally is you know equally as important when going into just the woods in general for yeah. like being able to get back out yeah i would say so you, you have you have to think right i fell through the ice one time on one of my otter adventures and it was what 35 below something like that it was a cold cold day and i was 17 or 18 k away now you know all of our instinct screams build a fire you know get get warm and all that and, I, and i'm thinking uh, you know i can get back in in this amount of time um and the cab was warm and and, and i'll be safe and that's what I did is I just booted for it. And uh, when it happened, I had this otter trap set. And <clears throat> this is where I said you wouldn't sleep as, as well at night worrying about falling through stuff. You know how you, when you walk alongside a, a, of a pond or whatever, you, you kind of walk on the cattails because there's that belief that it's solid there kind of thing? <laughs> it's not. <laughs> <laughs> they had a hole right at the edge of the cattails that they were coming up. And so I had it guarded with a 330 trap, right? I had a 330 laying over top of it and I'm walking up on it and then it's cold and you're kind of stumbling and I stumble and I'm, I fall and I'm falling straight towards it. My face is going to catch this trap, right? This set trap and it's laying there flat like this and, it, and it's set, you know, because I'm waiting for the otter to come up, up out of the, the hole. Well, I twist my body so that I don't get my face in the trap. I hit the ice and I go smooth through the ice right now. And I, I go, go way down. And I don't know, it's probably six feet deep, seven feet. I don't know. I don't, don't remember touching bottom. I go to turn around to get myself back out of there. And all I can think about is there's a trap up there somewhere that's <laughs> waiting to fall on me now. <laughs> so I, I get out of there and I, I must have looked like one of those penguins on National Nat Geo when, when I went out and I was on top of that ice like that. You know, was, <laughs> the trap had gone down the hole at some point and I never, never got entangled with it. So I was lucky on that. And then I jumped on the, on my machine and it was like, that was, you know, I looked around first off, it was like, should I build a fire and how far am I from the cabin? And off I went, Sandy uh, met me at the door. She knew something was wrong. Cause I was back early like that. And, and uh, how long did it take before we could get the clothes off me? Oh, well, you had to stand in front of the fireplace for a good long while because he was just frozen stiff. I, so. I was, if I'd have had to go for another 20 minutes or so, I probably couldn't have, I, there was a lot of stuff wouldn't bend anymore. Right. Mm-hmm yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah you just we so we just have a system where he checks in from time to time and i know roughly where he's at um if i have to go and find him then i then i go and find him but yeah. Yeah. um so far we haven't had any yeah. any circumstances like that and i think the biggest thing is because we are aware we never go out in the big bush at not not aware of what can happen and so being as prepared as one can be i mean there's always potential for a catastrophe an accident a, you know i mean he could be crossing a road and get hit by an oil truck out there somewhere you know i mean it's just it's life in general anything can happen to anybody you can fall getting out of bed and it can be catastrophic but here's, if you're here's... aware of the things that can go wrong you're much better prepared the funny part is is that uh I worry uh, more about my partner have to come try and find me and, and her having something go wrong makes me more responsible than me just worrying about myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's smart. Yeah. And, and thanks for underlining that too, Sandy. That was one of the, the points I wanted to draw on too, is just that uh, it can be the, the safety net is a little bit more removed when we, when we go farther and farther into the, the bush and it's just something to be aware of when we when we think yeah. about heading back is just have a plan be prepared and uh do everything yeah. you can ahead of time to put yourself in a good exactly. situation exactly exactly um i want i was curious here I, I i was scrolling the social media of trapping inc and there's a there's a contest going on right now is that yes it? <laughs> tell me about that what's what's going on there well, we did a little promo for it for Wild TV here not that long ago. And, and by far, the most popular question that we're asked is, can I send my husband trapping with you? <laughs> and there's usually a desperate, please, at the end of it. 
Um, and we did run a contest a few years ago. Um, and we had uh, just two of the best guests that you can oh. imagine. They were knowledgeable, but, you know, I mean, it. They were hardworking. Yeah. They just, they pitched right in and it was really a pleasure to have them. And then we thought, wow, we got really lucky. Yeah, we, and we and then we decided that we didn't want to do it again because maybe we weren't going to get somebody as, as good as those guests. But, um, but I think be having people be aware of the show and what we do and whatnot has really brought a lot of awareness to trapping in general, not just to, to us, but just as a, you know, like what is life? actually like out there and um and so we decided that we would do it as a as an additional promo uh this year so we are making the draw on september 1st um live actually on wild on tv, wild TV. Yeah. and uh then the trip i think is the first week of december well wow, that'll be whatever weather permitting i would and- like it- guests of availability and stuff. i would like to be the first week of december because i could knock their socks off yeah we can have everything martin fisher links yeah uh, but some of the best Honor opportunity Wolf, right stuff. pretty much everything is open at, well everything is open at that time as and, you slide into the deep winter things slow mm-hmm. um they the only thing that really keeps going are the canines and the and the links everything else slows pretty badly because uh, a lot of animals can't as funny as it sounds a martin can freeze it you know, he has They're to have, used to having all that snow. They do yeah. really well in a, a foot and a foot and a half to two feet of snow. Yeah. It really insulates them, and they travel a lot under the yeah. snow. Oh, really? It's called a subnivium climate. climate. There you go. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. That's well, super interesting. Yeah. What's the What's the best way for folks to enter the contest then, if they uh, wanted to come spend uh, a few days up at uh, at the camp? Well, you have to be a supporter. We have a a private. Do we go down this road? What the hell? Yes. <laughs> Fuck it, man. Fuck it. <laughs> we have a we have a private uh, community, and what started this was um, YouTube censoring us. Yeah. And they, when they decided that the same laws that apply to pedophiles apply to me taking my grandchildren out trapping, I was like, the hell with you people. So we, um, you know, they 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 demonetize that stuff. Now get this. This is the, this is their logic, and if you can explain it to me, then I'm I'm all ears. But they 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 punish me by demonetizing those those uh, videos. videos, but they run ads on it still, and they take all the money, but they punish me. So if something's so evil and ha- and heinous that I can't make money off it, why should can they make money off it and, and sleep at night? You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So here we started then looking for where we could go we we had a we actually have a patreon page all up and everything never pulled the trigger on it because then patreon turned out to be another one of the cluster on the left and and uh we ended up going with i don't know if you guys know dave rubin uh from uh the rubin report a uh, big podcaster he's a friend of joe rogan's and all that anyway he he has uh put together this uh platform called locals.com and on locals.com there are different communities we built a trapping in community and uh, so membership is, uh, well, it's free and whatever, you know, you, you get to uh, see a lot of stuff for free, but uh, other than that, it's either $5 a month or, or $50 for the year. And all of that's where all of our, our videos go now. Uh, not, nothing goes to YouTube anymore. I mean, we used to be huge on Amazon Prime and, and on YouTube, but, you know, the, as the censorship takes over and they change the, the algorithm, well, you're not there anymore. So if if you're not getting paid, you just can't do it, right? I mm-hmm. mean, the, the, this has to get paid for somehow. So that's what this is all about. And so we thought we'd use it as a uh, as a membership drive to try and get more subscribers for for locals.com if you go to our trap uh, or uh, our website uh, which is trappinginc.com you can't get on there without bumping into here's the contest and how to enter yeah, yeah. <laughs> well if i do want to do a quick plug here for uh to justify the cost you know if you're looking at entertainment wise or knowledge wise and, and i i use this uh this comparison quite frequently with other stuff that we we talk about but like that that uh, yearly membership is che- cheaper than a two for a beer so if you want to yeah. <laughs> look at it that way you know 
There yeah. you go. When I when I do pricing for doing video work and that, you know, um, hopefully the oil patch comes back good and strong because we used to do a lot of a lot of safety video and all that. But you you, you price out at one hundred fifty dollars an, an edited minute. Okay, so figure out how many edited minutes that that are in a uh, thirteen episode season let alone all the other stuff we do mm -hmm. you know and 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 uh podcasts and all, all that kind of stuff so i mean it's it i don't need to justify it but i always i always explain it that way and and uh uh the other thing is is that nobody there is not a single um uh, anti out there that will pay a nickel to come protest with us and if they do i'll give them their five bucks back or whatever i don't care you know i, I, I can i can <laughs> I can pull the we plug on their life. That. Yeah, I can yeah. pull the plug on their life support and, and <laughs> thumb my nose at them. <laughs> it's really a shame that you that you have to kind of segregate yourself that way. Uh, but that's kind of way the world has gone. Plus, you know, I mean, they, you've got all of these other channels. You think about Disney Channel and Netflix, and they've all got their own individual programming as well. Yeah. So. Um, you know, this is just an extension of that in a, in a smaller marketplace. I was curious about that because I know some of the other hunting shows and even that's something we have to keep our eye out on too, is just, it's not welcomed on some of the major platforms, yeah. right? So um, it makes it really challenging for, and um, you know, what I've seen from Trapping Inc is it's really honest takes on how folks want to connect to the outdoors and, you know, carry forward a tradition that's been here as long as Canada has. So um, it's it's kind of frustrating some uh, ways that we have to kind of, like you said, silo ourselves. But uh, I'm glad that you've you've found a mechanism here that's gonna. <laughs> well, gonna it's work funny. It's funny the the people who do watch us on outdoor uh, on Wild TV, outdoor programming on television, because. A lot of them, what what they want more of is life around the cabin. Yeah, it, you know they're not necessarily worried too much about. Give, you give know, us what, a plug on how, how big we are. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we 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 are the, the the number one outdoor programming in Canada. Uh, the, well, for the last three years that they've had uh, that, that had Nielsen numbers, we were runaway uh, number one. And I say this only because I have the Nielsen numbers; I can look at it most months we are like 89 percent over the channel average wow that's so incredible. that's that that's huge yeah. and they want um, more cabin and they yes. want we, you know what they want more of the of the two of us and it's just it's funny because we have we have friends that i mean they do a little bit of hunting but they don't trap and they maybe do a little bit of fishing and they'll sit down with a coffee or a beer or a, glass of scotch or whatever it is it's their pleasure and they and they just watch because we have fun out there yeah and i think that in many respects that's what people are looking for is is some kind of connection to you know whether it's it's couples connection or that they can identify and lots we get lots of emails you're just like me and my husband or or whatever you know yeah. you're, but it's all good natured. It's not like we, we, we're not fighting and we're, it's not a bunch of drama. It's just us being who we easiest, are. Easiest mm -hmm. gig you'll ever have guys. Yeah. Like it, all we're doing is chronicling our, our, our life. I mean, it's, it's that simple. This is who we are mm -hmm. day in and day out. And uh, it, it, so it's, it's pretty simple that way. We, we get the, the some of the craziest feedbacks we get and, and it's not just one, it's, it, it's hundreds, but we've learned more about marriage watching you guys. It's like, <laughs> it's, it's a little scary actually. <laughs> we had somebody oh, tell us that we should put on that was what were we doing somebody somebody sent anyway it was like you guys should put on a marriage course yeah i uh, no. <laughs> we got deep in the weeds on a podcast yeah we got pretty deep in the weeds on a podcast and got talking about what makes a successful marriage and all that kind of stuff <laughs> If if the if the trapping thing quits working for you guys, there you go. Is your backup plan? <laughs> oh, that's good. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I think the the key to life is lots of laughter, and and Absolutely. we certainly don't have a shortage of that. So. That's awesome. Yeah, that that's very clear. That's awesome and amazing. Um, <laughs> I've got one more big question here, or big picture question for you, if if you don't mind here before we kind of uh, look to wrapping up, but. Uh, cool. 
the what I'm seeing here is you know trapping ink and even your involvement prior to that you know Sandy you're, it sounded like you're really on the vanguard in some ways for um, women in the outdoors and um, um, trapping ink being a, a forefront for really showcasing an honest look at trapping life in Canada. Um, what do you what do you think's on the horizon here for trapping in Canada? Like what's what's the future here? What uh, what can some you know we've we've got people looking to reengage with the community. We've got new trappers. We've got seasoned trappers. Like where's this all headed? Do you think any any guesses? I know it's a big question, but well, it is. But um, I think what we've heard from a lot of different areas is that ca- uh, trapping is um, on the upswing. Yep. There are a lot more people that are, you know, and, and for a number of different reasons, I think, and, and that's kind of partly where the show is going maybe for the next while is just to think about life in general, you know, Mm -hmm. I mean, COVID's taught us a lot of things, some of them good, some of them not so good security. And, you know, you think about the, the lack of preparedness in general life that people have, um, they don't know where their food comes from. Um, there, there was a lot of concern about food availability, um, food safety, you know, I don't even know where little Debbie lives to go, you know, like, <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. make her cakes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we joke about it and it's funny, isn't it? Because we all know where our food comes from, but when you, when you think about people and it Hell, yeah, I was the, eating lettuce this afternoon. <laughs> well, this is where a lot of women are getting into hunting though. And even in places like um, in and around Toronto, they're looking for organic Mm-hmm. So very interesting, right? And they want to know where their food has come from. So it's, and it, it is, I, I don't know, women are, are starting to really be a little bit more independent, I guess, uh, about how they interact with the wild. And I think out of that comes an awareness of what they don't know. They're, they're starting to figure out what they don't know. And so then they look to different channels to figure that out and i think trapping it and trapping ink specifically kind of plays into that a little bit and that's kind of where the next seasons are going to start going is a is a little bit more about okay you know food preparedness do you do you know how to make bread if you can't buy bread at the store do you know you know do you know how to raise a chicken do you know how to grow a garden do you know how to preserve do you know you like lots of different things like that that i think you know we can teach one thing though i'd like to point out before we go down that road is that uh, i think that we're discovering more and more of the, the, the most important part of civilization is the family unit I, yeah. and the mother the wife is always that cornerstone that bedrock that foundation of the of that family unit and and it goes goes down to like if the the dad hunts fishes or traps Maybe the kids go, maybe they don't. Maybe he goes with his buddies. If the mom hunts fishes and traps, the whole family does. And then then the next gener- then we're, we're bringing up that next generation. So that is the one thing that, that yeah. she has has taught me and, and, and is teaching millions of people out there is, is how important it is to be involved in those things. This isn't just a man's world, not by any means. Mm. I would say that's true. I mean, that's something that you know, when we started um, Outdoor Quest TV and, and Kim and I were on the forefront of that, it, it became very, very apparent. They, they never had a family, but we have ch- three children and, and now they all have children. And that's how, you know, they're raised. Our, our daughter's our oldest and uh, she went away to university uh, in Saskatoon and she didn't know anybody. And made friends fairly quickly and met her future husband there and and their family farm was not that far from Saskatoon so she used to go there on weekends and I remember uh Mitchell's mom telling me that she knew he'd found a keeper because they had a dead calf and uh and they had twins and so they were going to try and get the one twin onto the mother that lost the calf so she gave Melissa a knife and said go skin that calf and she did she did. She said, <laughs> I told Mitchell right there, that girl's a keeper, <laughs> you know? So it, it is about teaching your children more than, 
than you know uh, some of the basics of of life it's it's that you can do more than maybe your friends do or your peers do or you could do different things and it's still okay and your life is going to be good mm -hmm. but um but richard's right like that's what we've seen with the families that we interact with is if if mom's involved the, the whole family's usually involved yep yeah it's, it's and that interesting. brings in in the kids and that's that's so important and it's interesting how that kind of contrasts um, as we look at more people looking to re-engage with that kind of lifestyle. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think to a few conversations that we've had with uh, Inuit folk on our, our podcast and um, the way that they've described hunting in, in their culture is so matter of fact um, that it's almost, it, it felt to me talking to them that it was almost nonsensical to, 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 to imagine that someone would not be involved in that process yeah. in their community. So that that's just the reality. There are subsistence hunters up there and everyone's involved in that process. So to, to, um, I guess there's, there's still a lot of learning that I think we can take and um, just how important it is for, for us to all be connected to where our food comes from and, yeah. you know, and that whole process from start to finish. Well, and family unit too, I think is, is really critical because I, I think that there isn't as much of that, um, you know, like when we, when we got married there, there was certainly less divorce then oh, yeah. than there is now, but, um, well, even, I mean, it was everything, right? You went out hunting, you shot a moose. Well, they, the, the head came back on the hood of the truck. Cause you know, that you were, you're proud of what you did. That's, <laughs> that's just a terrible thing to do today. That's, that's, you could probably get arrested for doing it, which is, which is terrible. The, probably the biggest reason why I, got so mad with with youtube when they started censoring me about my grandchildren is they are cutting me off from the next generation and mm -hmm. without that next generation we don't continue on and we have lots of kids like i mean we inter interact with kids and that all the time and lots and lots of kids that, that there are just fascinated kids are honest face it kids are bloody little savages they have no conscience or anything else when when they're born and it's not until they're, they're about 18 that they, they that they develop one and so they're the perfect person to teach all all this stuff too you know to, they, they they have no qualms and then they can make their decisions for themselves they're capable of, of making those decisions uh, intelligently they just need to be introduced to it but mm -hmm. we're, we're we're taking that all away where they don't even get a chance to be introduced and the thing that bothered me the most was that when I started getting censored by YouTube, it was uh, when you first get censored, uh, it's AI that does it. Mm. Okay. And their whole real reason for it being artificial intelligence that, that flags you and censors you and everything is that because artificial, artificial intelligence doesn't have any bias. Well, except the bias of the, of the person that yeah. programmed. Right. Mm -hmm. And it takes, I don't know, I think about three, three appeals before you get to actually talk to a person. When I talk to a person, um, of course, you're talking to somebody on 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 the uh, you know east or west coast of of the uh, United States and in uh, you know Seattle or whatever, and you know you explain to them that you're educational, you're historic, and all this kind of stuff, and it's all those key words, you know. And I I say you know you we're not doing anything illegal, and you know you get them around to, but around to your way of of thinking that, and then they say but you're skinning an animal. And I said, you know what, uh, you know, are you wearing leather shoes? You know, did you eat a Big Mac? You know, mm -hmm. which is not a good question to ask somebody in Seattle because probably not. But, <laughs> yeah, you, 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 but you know where I'm going. And and I said, you know, you, you need to, you you need to realize that because you choose not to kill your supper, or you choose not to kill your your boots or whatever, you can't judge me if I choose to. Mm -hmm. Somebody's still doing the killing. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's definitely a, a big disconnect that's that's been happening over the last couple decades here, and I feel like there's there's a strong fight coming from our end to uh, to open the eyes of people that are in that same situation where they still are consuming, they're still using all these animal products, but they're they're disconnected from the blood and the guts and all the real life stuff that actually happens behind the scenes. Yeah. It's it's much the same argument as the oil and gas industry is is up against right now because you know um, everybody has an iPhone, yeah. but <laughs> but they hate oil and gas. Yeah, you know? so, yeah. I, I mean it's a it's an argument without end. I think, but I, we're doing our part. I think from an educational perspective and 
um, just to let people know that it's still relevant in today's world. Well, not only that, but when they, people talk about uh, about things being, you know, uh, uh, conservation or, or cruelty and all that kind of stuff. Um, there's only four ways an animal dies, okay? Um, and you can look it up, but a, any study will tell you that that uh, the number of animals that die of old age is is insignificant, okay? So that's not even a choice that they're going to ride off the sunset and Bambi's <laughs> dad's going to die on, you know, a happy death. No, they can starve to death. They can die of disease. They can get ate by another animal or they can die in my trap. And in my trap, they die in 120 seconds. You know, when my time comes, I'll take that 120 seconds. Yeah. You know, like people just don't, they, people just don't connect to that at all. They don't understand. They think that that animal is going to continue to live unless I interfere with it. Well, that's not true. Uh, you know, on on average, with fur bears, about eighty percent of them don't make their first winter, yeah, because they starve to death, or they get disease, or another animal eats them. Yeah, they're their own kind. Sometimes is yeah. likely a dog eat dog world out there for a lot of these animals. Absolutely, absolutely, and that's that's Mother Nature's way. It, it, you know, she has you know an eight pound walleye throws a hundred thousand eggs. You know, only one percent of that hundred thousand has to make it to spawn in order for walleye to continue on. That's just the way she designs it. She's just all boom and bust, mm -hmm. you know? Well, we've been going for almost two hours here, you guys. And this has been <laughs> Time flies or yeah, fun? a phenomenal conversation. And I'm sure we could go for another two with, uh, with you two folks. And, and it's, um, you know, we've, we've certainly learned a lot. We've, we're taking a lot away from this conversation with you guys. And, um, a big thank you to you guys for, for doing what you do and, and, uh, battling on and, and finding ways to connect with people, finding avenues to, to make sure like you guys can secure a way to continue this and continue passing this on. And, and like you said, just trying to break through to the younger generations and educate and just keep everything going, fighting the good fight. Thank you. We, uh, we really enjoyed having a conversation with you guys. It was good. <laughs> We, we got seven grandchildren that we're fighting for. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you. Awesome. That, uh, that always adds an X factor to the, any, any uh, motivation in life, but yeah, huge. Thank you for coming on the, the podcast and uh, hopefully we'll see you uh, down the road sometime. Yeah. I hope so too. Yeah. Now that we can start traveling around, that would be awesome. Yeah. You can. yeah. Take well, care. Good luck on the trap line this winter, you guys. Thank you. Thanks again for listening, folks, to episode 95 of the Panoramic Outdoors podcast. We hope you enjoyed that episode. Thanks again to Rich and Sandy for joining us. And, uh, man, I feel like we could have them back on and just have another amazing podcast session with them. The The two hours that we had them on for was just went by in a flash, felt like to me. Yeah, and there, there's... Uh... There's no way that uh, we could have talked about anything. I feel like with them, right? There's we could have chatted about uh, camp life. We could have chatted about life in general. I feel like they're just uh, they're an open book in a lot of ways, and uh, uh, approachable, right? So like if uh, if you're curious about trapping and stuff like that, they said they they answer DMs and stuff like all the time, right? So like uh, mm -hmm. get in touch with them if you need. We love talking with them, and I think that they, uh, they're they there to do the right thing in the trapping community. Yeah, amazing. Before we let you go, folks, um, don't forget to give us a rate on whatever platform you're listening to. That helps us a heck of a long way to um, keep this podcast moving forward and catch up to the big guys like Meat Eater and all those fancy buggers out there. Um, before that, before you leave, though, too, we have uh, – some youth hats hitting the store here right away limited numbers so some black and orange and some pink and black hats if you're if you're looking at getting uh your kid something for christmas birthday maybe a happy hunting season present there you go and if you're looking to get into that eye hunter discount you're going to want to check out web.ihunterapp.com that's the fastest way to get there and uh, also, if you want to follow Rich and Sandy along on their adventures, the best way to do that is to look at their YouTube channel, Trapping Inc., or you can follow them along on Instagram, Trapping Inc. TV. 
they got a ton of content they're they got a ton of free content on youtube and now they're transitioning their platform onto a more or their uh, content on a more fan specific platform so be sure to follow them along they're doing great things for trapping in canada and uh we really appreciated having them on the show today you betcha till next time keep your knife sharp keep those arrows with a high foc nice and uh stick on the ice keep your stick on the ice episode 95 sydney crosby crosby made 95 a very popular number so uh just take a look out for that and uh yeah have a good one folks